All right, everybody, let's talk about depression, the memory palace, method of low-key as a mnemonic device to facilitate access to self-affirming personal memories for individuals with depression. This is scientific evidence that my experience with feeling way better from using memory techniques, especially the memory palace, was not just some kind of... uh, bizarre incident, but there's actually been research into this, which I'm very, very excited to uh, to find out about. And one of the interesting things about it is in our last stream, if you caught it, we, like things that came up, some pretty raw, sensitive issues. And one of the uh, constant topics is, you know, what do you do if you have bad memories in a memory palace? And I have some uh, bad memories from memory palaces that have to do with the depression, having had to be in a hospital, for example. And uh, that is, uh, you know, a challenge to have to go back to those. And then there are some areas, places in life that, uh, you know, just have bad memories associated with them. But using the memory palace can help clean it out a little bit. Just using memory techniques in general has certainly, for me, been a path to healing in many, many respects. And uh, I want to help people in that regard. And I'm so glad that there's some scientific uh, evidence behind how that we can all do that. So I want to say hello to Harvinder. Thanks for being here, Harvinder. Baklal is here in India. Namaste to you both. Really great to meet with you here today. And uh, if you're joining us on the live stream, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And uh, yeah, uh, this is one of the most important topics that we can talk about because the memory technique called the memory palace literally saved my life. A lot of people say, I don't know how much, how you do all this energy and (laughs) all this stuff. Well, if something like this saved your life, you'd probably have a hard time shutting up about it as well. And I mean more than just saved life, but like it just keeps getting better all the time because of what continual use of spatial memory that the memory palace unlocks does for you, especially when you then start turning it to memorizing information that really takes things to the next level, such as self-inquiry through uh, some of the things that I've been doing with uh, Advaita Vedanta and so forth. And uh, thanks everybody who's been letting me know, those of you who know Sanskrit, that my pronunciation is pretty good. That's uh, quite lovely. I really appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, just getting started because I really like what I'm learning and uh, it's a lot of fun and it's it's very, very powerful. So if you're not memorizing any of the Sanskrit stuff that I'm memorizing and you want to free your mind even more than using a memory palace will do, free your mind from suffering, that is, well, I highly recommend that stuff. And it's really innocuous. It's just like memorizing scientific formulas that... Uh, really can do no harm, but only do good. And the meditation itself does good. And one of the reasons why the memory palace technique helped me so much in what we're going to see in the science here is precisely because using memory techniques is not that different from uh, from meditation. I, I'm quite convinced that it uh, accesses various similar um, parts of the mind. Uh, to just to memorize. And of course, how do you memorize? Well, you get quiet, you sit with information, you encode it, and you're very, very present, right? So it has to be, it has to be very similar to meditation. Going to get the budget together one of these days to do the brain scans, but isn't this exciting that these people have already done the research? So Eric's in the house. Good to see you, Eric. Thanks for being here. Chanel is here. Have you decided to learn Hindi as of yet? No, I haven't decided. Great question, though. Thank you for that, and thank you for being here. Um, not sure why we're getting double posts from Facebook people. Sorry about that, but uh, kind of cool, too. It looks ooh, doubled. Um, no, I haven't decided to learn Hindi because I'm learning Chinese and Sanskrit and maybe Hindi in the in the near future. You know, I studied sitar for so many years. I remember some of the vocabulary around the sitar, but... Um, not even sure if that was Hindi or Erdu, to tell you the truth. Um, Physico is in the house. Good to see you. Mr. Space is in the house. Good to see you. Uh, Physico says, I'm very depressed about here, about memory helps me feel. Hello, doctor. Not to worry. It's just a cold. Oh, you're sick. Okay, not depressed. Good. Um, and Mr. Space says, another live stream. Very cool. Yeah, if you like these live streams, hit the thumbs up. Get active. 
with your questions and your comments. Got the live stream here so we can all see what's going on on the screen. Makes the uh, replay maybe a little bit more fun. And uh, let's dive into this. But since we have some science on the screen here, maybe we'll talk just a little bit about how I would suggest you read science. Because I've read a lot of scientific articles in my day. And it's a bit counterintuitive. And not a lot of people read things this way. But this is how I read things. And uh, I think you'll find this useful. So instead of starting at the beginning, why don't we start at the end? Now, why do this? Well, one of the things that is really, really useful is to know what the references are, what's coming, right? So when I look at something like this, like it's pretty interesting, first of all, to know that this was funded by the UK Medical Research Council. So maybe we don't know what that is, but it's a little detail to keep in mind, right? And then we have references. So one of the first things that I notice here is that there's some unusual books that they're referencing. So for example, they're referencing Jonathan D. Spence, The Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci. They are mentioning Yeats, The Art of Memory, which can't quite get up on the screen there, but it's at the bottom. And uh, as far as I could see, that's those are really the only two memory books. So neither of those were written by people who really know the um, the, the, I mean, Yates famously says that uh, she never used the memory techniques that she talks about, right? And yet it's one of the most influential books about memory techniques, but she says like in the first couple pages, she never used them. So that's interesting. And then Jonathan D. Spence, I, I, I don't recall him saying in the Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci that he himself didn't personally use them, but I have a feeling that he did. And uh, you can tell in both those books that they, they've never really used memory techniques by the way that they describe them in this completely outsider way, which is why uh, I'm nearly done the translation of Matteo Ricci's uh, Shigua Jifa. And I can tell you that there's there's interesting things that Jonathan D. Spence doesn't pick up because he obviously doesn't use the techniques himself. So we can uh, bolt that in. But in any case, isn't that interesting? And here we have von Restorf, Übri Verkung uh, von Bereichsbildungen im Spürenfeld, which is interesting um, that we have von Reschdorf there. Anybody know von Reschdorf? Do you know about the von Reschdorf effect? Very interesting step. Um, oh, we do have Cicero in here, another memory expert. Um, and that's uh, something to see. Anyway, start at the end. And we're doing a couple of things here. We're seeing the field that they're drawing upon. And then we're just looking at some of the other things that they might be talking about. So just keywords like neuroimaging and um, social adjust judgment coming up here. Uh, and I'm just priming my mind lightly, which helps. It's like laying breadcrumbs in advance. When you start to read the actual article, then you can look for some of this stuff. And you're just more involved, I find anyway, that I'm more involved in the article when I start here as opposed to at the beginning. Sometimes what I'll do is read the discussion first because that uh, also primes the mind for what's coming. And it also just helps you know, like, do you, do you really need to read this? Um, and then I'll go and read the abstract. So just a little tip for you. Other things, you know, is obviously you want to notice the Association for Psychological Science here and um, uh, do some of this stuff like SageBub and so forth. If you're not familiar with those things, it's good to get familiar with them so you know the the bodies that are behind the literature a little bit. And then uh, look at the names of people. So, you know, do you recognize any of those names? Do you need to put them in memory? And, uh, you know, who knew there was a Medical Research Council Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at Cambridge uh, in the UK? Very, very interesting. All right. So let's see here. Check in with the chat. Um, Baklol says, I'm a beginner here. Where should I start from, sir? Great question. Let me uh, give you a link and pop it in the chat that you should, uh, well, first of all, get subscribed if you're not already subscribed. And if you're joining us now, get subscribed if you're not subscribed and um, hit the thumbs up button and let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And Baklol, take the free course. I'm popping it in the chat for you there. Um, better put it in the YouTube chat so you can, um, I don't know why that weird face comes up. I shouldn't have put it in that. I got so many windows open here. You guys have no idea the <laughs> lengths to which we go uh, to make these live streams for you and uh, not looking for a pat on the back, but <laughs> the, the, te the technology is intense and I'm a little bit uh, weird looking 
but that's okay. All right, so um, like I said, let me know where you are in the world in the chat. Let me know what you're doing, what you're thinking, how you're feeling. Any questions that come up while we go through this, just pop them in the chat. We'll either answer them immediately or we'll um, catch them later. And we're going to uh, have a great session. And I want to just read this. I want to read this because I think it's just super interesting. And we can derive some things from it because there's proof, evidence. And I have my own anecdotal story to tell you, which is... Uh, not a surprise to any doctor that I tell this to because memory techniques are essentially brain exercise. Brain exercise makes you feel better uh, because it's exercising your brain and opening up all kinds of uh, um, many, many, many things that are happening, right? Because your brain is made out of material. It's made out of neural networks and neurons and, and just lots of stuff. Blood is flowing through it. Oxygen, your brain needs so much oxygen. And the more you use it, the more you're actually getting this. And that's why memorizing Sanskrit chants, for example, I think has such an impact. Uh, and, and especially the singing of them or the reciting of them, because it's also creating some healing chemicals and so forth. So um, that's uh, really important. Let's... Uh, Let's read the title of this first, see what we can derive from the title, and then we'll catch up with some of the chats and, uh, and then get into the article. So method of Loki or Loci or Loci, depending on how people pronounce it, as a mnemonic device to facilitate access to self-affirming personal memories for individuals with depression. All right, so what is this saying here? To facilitate access to self-affirming personal memories for individuals with depression. This is really, really important because when I've been depressed, you really have a hard time thinking of anything positive. And it really is like it's blocked. And people can even remind you of great things. And you're still just like, no. Even if you can recognize it, it's like you can't access it. It's like it's away from you. It's, it's removed from you in, in a bad, bad way. And so this is a very interesting title here. Self-affirming personal memories. Access, access. All right, so Tim Dalglish, Lauren Navratti, Eleanor Bird, Emma Hill, Barnaby D. Dunn, and Anna Marie Golden. We thank you for your uh, work here. Thank you very much. Let's look at the abstract. Depression impairs the ability to retrieve positive, self-affirming autobiographical memories. To counteract this difficulty, we trained individuals with depression either in episode or remission to construct an accessible mental repository for a pre-selected set of positive, self-affirming memories using an ancient memory technique, the method of LOCI, MOL. Participants in a comparison condition underwent a similar training protocol where they chunked the memories into meaningful sets and rehearsed them. Both protocols enhanced memory recollection to near ceiling levels after one week of training. However, on a surprise follow-up recall test a further week later, recollection was maintained only in the MOL condition, relative to a significant decrease in memories recalled in the rehearsal group. There was no significant performance differences between those currently in episode and those in remission. The results support use of the MOL as a tool to facilitate access to self-affirming memories in those with depression. So this is really, really great. Um, Notice it's autobiographical memory as well. Who here saw today's previous video on autobiographical memory? I know it's a little bit too much, but the sooner we can get this information out to people today, then the, the better, because you can help spread this around. But who watched the autobiographical memory video from today? Check in with our chat. Harry's here from Indonesia. Mr. Space says, I'm thinking to stop being lazy. Physico asks, Dr. Will you... Publish the translation of Matteo Ricci's book. I do have my own method to get Chinese, uh, Chinese or, or um, I don't even know those characters, but I guess they're uh, they're uh, Tensa or something like this. But I would love more help of a master in them. I'm not even studying characters yet, so you got to write to me in Pinyin. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is uh, going to come out eventually, um, and stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, really with the, uh, with the Chinese writing, I get the help from my wife in there, in that book. All right. Um, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a very long story about how exactly I'm translating this, 
but that story will be told later. Um, because it was a long adventure to even get the Shigua Jifa, and uh, man, it took a while. But now I've got it, and luckily it is in a language that I can read. Um, but uh, I'm not translating it directly from the Chinese. So it's going to be like a translation of a translation with help from my wife who can read. Uh, but it's really complex because classical Chinese is even more riddle-based and four-word-based than modern Chinese. Anyway, it's a great adventure. I'm having a lot of fun. And I'm almost done. That's the beauty of it. I'm done the first draft, better said. So then we need to go into some other stuff. Anyway, it's complex. I kind of feel like a little bit like Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound did all these Asian translations and he did all kinds of weird and wonderful adventures to get it done. And uh, I think of him a lot because he had these three ways of doing translation. One is called Logopoya, one is called Fanapoya, and one is called Melopoya. And because I have the opportunity to really help with my, my Chinese understanding from someone who can guess what the classical Chinese would have sounded like, we can, we can use that to our advantage to help craft this, this, uh, this translation in a way that uh, perhaps others could not. But who knows? There could be better people to translate it. But in any case, to answer your question, Physical, yes, I'm going to translate it. I'm going to publish it eventually. All right. Oh, <laughs> so Physical is saying that is Hansa in traditional my favorite. Okay, great, great. Well, that's what I guessed. I mean, I could see the the uh, the final character there, um, and I think I've seen that before. But in any case, it's kind of weird. I know it's weird. A lot of people um, wonder about this. And actually, we just got a. There was a comment here on YouTube um, where someone just said, "Look, I re I really want to learn Japanese, but I just." the characters are, 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 are nuts. And I just, I just want to focus on Romaji or Romanji as it's sometimes called. And I just said, look, I have no problem with this. It makes total sense to me. Uh, when you just want to learn something you could, that has complicated character sets, if you're never going to read in the language, there's nothing wrong with just focusing on oral Chinese. And in, in some cases, at least from what I understand, like speaking with my wife all the time, I'm learning from these different sources. And she's like, no one ever says that. That's 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 written Chinese, right? And so it's almost like you have to, I don't know about Japanese, uh, but it's almost like you have to learn Chinese twice if you want to learn Chinese because um, of this difference between oral Chinese, everyday spoken Chinese, and then what is written. And often, you know, it's just uh, super <laughs> complex. So there's nothing wrong with actually just learning oral Chinese and I have a great time speaking with my father-in-law every day almost, like barely ever skip a day, and uh, speaking with my wife and just learning it orally without any any reading. Now, there's a downside to that, which is, you know, next time I'm in China, I'm not going to have progressed in reading many signs or anything like this. But last time I was there, I didn't, I didn't really need to read them either. I have done memorize some characters, though. And uh, it is fun, but it's just, it's not like the, the speediest path to the outcome that I'm looking for. So language learning experts uh, disagree a lot about this, but uh, I personally have no problem with people just learning and not putting the worries and concerns of experts in your way. Uh, it's just like... Uh, it reminds me of something in the Tao Te Ching, which is, you know, when you stop trying to be clever, the thieves and beggars disappear. And there's all kinds of people who are trying to convince you that their way is the correct way, etc., etc. And I've never really liked that. And it's why I run the Magnetic Mary Method the way I do. It's a method that helps you create your own systems. And you got to create them. No memory athlete I've ever, uh, ever known or encountered does anything other than learn the methods and the principles and then use them to create their own quote unquote systems. But those systems are often so flexible that they're not really even deserving of the word system. So we need to keep all of that in mind. And you need to like think about the tyranny that experts put on you and then try to find, you know, just people who who have the expertise and are willing to not be experts, not to not to have their you know, constant ego dances and stuff that actually can imprison you. They can actually discourage you because they say, well, you need a thousand hours or you need 10,000 hours or you need this, that, or the other thing. Nonsense. 
You need what you need, and it's never going to be any number other than the number that you wound up with. Nobody can predict it. Nobody knows, but they pretend that they do, and that often imprisons a lot of people because it creates mental images that they then correspond their behavior to instead of just exploring with openness and inspiration and just taking action and then figuring out what worked for them based on some wherewithal uh, in terms of just open exploration. So that doesn't mean we don't listen to what they say, but we just don't get imprisoned by it. It's very, very uh, important principle in life. All right, Harry says he saw the autobiographical memory. Awesome. Thanks for checking that out. Mr. Space, you need some sleep, I guess, but uh, check it out when you have a chance. I think you'll really like it. There's some exercises there for you. Aries says, as a depressed person, it's very hard to remember my past. That's interesting, Aries. Well, maybe this uh, article will help you out. And um, Chanel says, you might want to seek out help from the Slovakian polyglot named Vladimir Skulteti with your project. All right, that'd be great. Christos asks, well, Christos, first of all, it's, it's always Anthony, never Tony. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a long story to tell about that, which I won't tell now, but it's always Anthony. Um, but there is a Tony Buzan who goes by Tony. Um, Physical says, yes, oral Chinese is very good, although my dream is to be able to read Hansa. So just choose what your dream is and memorize what you need to go. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind reading it either. I just wouldn't mind versus... I'm going to do it is uh, two different things. Whereas I just love to uh, to pick up some stuff so I can speak with my family better. That's just good enough for me. Physical says, very good video about autobiographical memory. Useful for smiling. Okay. <laughs> great, great. All right. Let's continue on with it. Read some of this. Um, so we got some keywords here. That's interesting to notice. Depression, autobiographical memory, method of Losi Lokai Loki. Cognitive training. So cognitive training. Interesting keyword, right? I want to keep that in mind. And let's check this out. Make sure it's on the screen here. Couldn't really get it much bigger. The recollection of autobiographical memories of self-affirming positive experiences in the day-to-day -day has been identified as a core adaptive emotion regulation strategy to counteract downturns in negative affect. Accessing such memories appears profoundly difficult for those with depression where recollection seems biased in favor of negative, self-devaluative events. Even when more positive memories are successfully brought to mind, this appears to have little beneficial impact on mood for those with a history of depression and may even be detrimental. This lack of impact on mood may reflect the quality of the recollected memories, when in a negative mood, individuals with a history of depression have been shown to recall positive memories that were markedly less vivid than those retrieved by never depressed peers. Furthermore, depressed individuals' autobiographical memories have a greater tendency to be categorical, even when depression is in remission. Such categorical memory remembering is characterized by general themes reflecting repetition and regularity across personal experiences, including positive events, as opposed to recollection of the sorts of specific individual events that can act in the service of mood repair. This is very interesting, actually, because I would say that's true in my experience. I have been locked into this categorical kind of remembering. And uh, it's very, very repetitive. It's got a, like an OCD kind of quality to it. I don't know uh, if you can uh, relate to that a little bit, um, Aries Cosmos, but it is uh, quite interesting now that, I, now that I read this. And I don't know exactly how to describe this categorical sort of thing, but it's very repetitive. And it's like the same memories come up again and again and again. <clears throat> and you maybe you logically uh, solve it, so to speak, and you defanged it and it's gone and you're like healed from it and it's, it's reduced, then it just like comes back again and it's like the same punishment, the same pain from this memory loop. And it's, it's just really, really weird. I used to have this all the time. I don't really have it anymore, which is a very beautiful thing. Um, I still have some repetition that can be annoying from time to time, but memorizing these tools from Sanskrit has been a great weapon against that. But think of, think of that... And I'd be curious to know from people who have never had depression, if they have um, something like where they just have these general themes that come up up again, or is it more fluid and varied and so forth? Because that is um, 
definitely something where I think I can I can understand that this this categorical um, and repetitive uh, me- memorizing and it's the same thing with positive events so it's not as it says here it's not just negative things but many many um, positive memories come to mind again and again and again and again and it's it's really odd um, and it is a kind of OCD repetitiveness and if you ever read um, the story of Jill Price uh, the woman who can't forget I believe is the title of the book she um, has hyperthemesia and one of the things that came out in some of the commentary on that is that there may be in some of these cases of hyperthemesia a kind of obsession obsessive personality type that is actually repeating this stuff so much that that it's not really hyperthemesia but rather it's a, an effect produced by obsessive dwelling on the autobiographical uh, memory. And I think that's compelling to a certain extent. I don't think it's the full answer, but I think it's, uh, it's quite compelling. And there is some, some journaling that, that goes on in, in the case of Jill Price that I don't think really came through in her book, but it came through later in documentaries. Um, and this is, uh, something very, very important to, to think about in terms of how you can, actually do maybe a little bit of self-induced OCD in a positive way. Because when you know how to use a memory palace and you know how to use recall rehearsal effectively, then you're going to be a little bit obsessive about it so that you get it into long-term memory, but in a very healthy and useful way. So that's important. All right, Mr. Space says, this principle of not to be prisoned by other people's opinion is extremely beneficial. Glad you find it that way, Mr. Space. And for Aries says, for me, it seems like a bad belief keeps ruminating in me, like things I like and problems I have. Yeah, well, I think um, you can work on that and and uh, probably relieve some of that pain. And this article has some suggestions. Uh, let me get some water here. Could be subconscious memories. I really don't know, but... You know, when I was in psychoanalysis, uh, it was never really about subconscious memory. It was more about learning, uh, learning about um, unconscious communication, which is a little bit different than subconscious uh, memory. Perhaps related, perhaps. Anyway, very, very interesting topics, to be sure. All right. Um... Crystal says, hey, guys, I switched my profile. Why isn't my message displayed? Uh, I see your message now, so maybe it thinks you're being a spammer. I don't know. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, (laughs) I don't know what that would be about. Or maybe you're not subscribed as your other profile. That might be why. Uh, Crystal says, it's conscious that you can make it automatic or subconscious. Okay, great. Um... If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking in the chat, and we'll catch up with any questions, comments, things you would like to add as we go along. Let's let's carry on with this uh, article. There is some evidence that enhancing access to specific and sufficiently elaborated positive or self-affirming memories can have beneficial effects on mood for those who are depressed. For example, when positive autobiographical memory scripts of depressed participants are suitably enriched with sensory and affective information, they actually have a greater impact on positive mood than do comparably elaborated memories in never depressed peers. Similarly, when those with depression are asked to focus on concrete aspects of positive memories, for example, the moment-to-moment experience of the memories, as opposed to processing them in an abstract fashion, reflecting on the causes, meanings, and consequences, then the memories again have a positive impact on mood. Very cool. Together, these findings emphasize that individuals with depression can benefit when provided with the right kinds of positive memories to process. Memories that are elaborated and vivid and populated with concrete details. However, an altogether different challenge is how to facilitate everyday access to such memories after they have been identified. The current study investigated a candidate strategy to meet this challenge, the method of Losi Lokai Loki, MOL. Beautiful. Okay, so the MOL 
is a mnemonic device that relies on memorized spatial relationships between low key, low si, low si, locations on a familiar route, rooms in a familiar building to arrange and recollect memorial content. The basic method uses visual imagery to associate each to be remembered event or piece of information with one of the Loki Losi Losi. Note, it's not just visual imagery. We need to use multiple senses. Uh, and we have videos about that on the YouTube channel and on the Magnetic Mary Method blog. In fact, let me share a link with you right now so you can get it into your, uh, your brain immediately. Um, because it's super important. There's some sensory memory exercises that I have for you. And one of the problems that a lot of these articles have is that they talk about visualization. And they make it seem like it's about visual pictures. And this is not the case. And it's what gets a lot of people hung up, is that they don't use the full range of the representation centers of their brains. So check out the five sensory memory exercises that I have for you on the Magnetic Memory Method blog. That link should be popping up for you right now. There it is. And it's at sensory memory exercises. You can just search Google Magnetic Memory Method sensory memory exercises or clicky click that linky link and it'll help correct this problem because it is a problem. Um, because a lot of people just aren't visual. I'm not visual. And it was one of my problems when I got into memory techniques is they kept talking about pictures. Even I talked about pictures uh, before I realized that this is not helpful for so many people. They're locked out. And being locked out is not good. Not good. All right. So the MOL, uh, ba the basic method uses visual imagery to associate each to be remembered event or piece of information with one of the loci loci loci. loci. Okay, I'll stop doing that, but it's well, maybe I won't. I like that loci loci loci. By this means, material can be recollected simply by mentally retracing the route around. I'm going to call them magnetic stations because that's what they really are. Around the magnetic stations and using the image of each place on this imagined journey as a cue. The MOL was first described in Roman rhetorical treatises. For example, in De Oratoria, Cicero advised that persons desiring, how would that be pronounced actually? De Oratora. Persons desiring to train this faculty of memory must select places and form mental images of the things they wish to remember and store those images in the places so that the order of the places will preserve the order of the things and the images of the things will denote the things themselves. Okay, so again, we have this like emphasis on images, but it's not really that much about images. All right, let's see. Let's check in with our chat. Hello, Bob. Good to see you, Bob. Thanks for saying hello. Hit that thumbs up if you're joining us. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And Physico says, can you show us the link of the research? I would love to use it in my presentation for showing people the loci 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 method. Um, yeah, well, actually, I have access to university uh, articles, and so I don't have a link for it that isn't behind a paywall. Um, but because I have university access, I have access to it. And one of the things that happens in the Magnetic Memory Method Mastermind is that I share some of this scientific research there. Um, so that's... Uh, I, I, in this case, I don't even know if this one can be shared there. But in any case, um, it, I, you might be able to contact the authors and ask them for a copy. But obviously, there's uh, some considerations behind that to be considered. Sophia is in the house from Sweden. Thanks for saying hello, uh, Sophia. Great to, to meet you here. And uh, uh, look forward to hearing any questions that you may have. And anybody who is joining us, this is your opportunity to ask questions. Aries Cosmos back in the chat history says, um, can we use memory to achieve a positive mindset? Absolutely. That's what we're talking about today. And we're talking about how the memory palace can do it. And we're presenting science that demonstrates some research that people have done into this. And I was just blown away and grateful that someone had actually done this research because it's been my experience. And, uh, if you saw the video I did where I did the recitation of 32 verses from the, uh, uh Ribhu Gita which is an ancient text, 
those 32 verses are gathered together in a book. It's an extract from the Ribhu Gita, but I have the full Ribhu Gita over here, and it's beautiful. I read the whole thing. It's amazing. Um, but Gary Weber collected them in a book called Evolving Beyond Thought precisely for the purpose of helping people remove mental suffering from their minds because the meanings of these phrases help remind you to not be focused on your body, to not be focused on the thoughts in your mind, but rather to be focused on something quite different that's a little bit difficult to explain what it is, but um, uh, it's very, very interesting what the the effects are. And we can talk a little bit about it if people are interested. Um, and there's a few other extra parts to it. But I was never going to remember that stuff if I didn't use a memory palace. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, so I used a memory palace. And I have been feeling so much better ever since. And I was already feeling great from uh, years and years of uh, memory training. So it just gets better and better and better. And if you really learn these techniques and then apply them to memorizing something like self-inquiry, you're going to have an amazing, amazing... Uh, improvement in your life. Uh, and, you know, it's just science. It's just basically memorizing scientific questions that cause you to remember to look at what is the truth about reality, which is that nothing's going on. <laughs> you know, there's this drama inside your head and uh, you can reduce the suffering of it by just identifying it in a way that dispels it and removes it completely. So Colonel Woman Walking is in the house briefly, dropping in to say hello. I have two omissions, so won't be in the stream tonight, but I memorized poetry to lift me up. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, good to see you. Sorry you have these admissions. Maybe they will uh, get magically healed all of a sudden. Boom, wouldn't that be nice? And then you can join us. But uh, if not, this uh, this research, uh, well, the re replay will be here uh, insofar as replays are something that people can, uh, can get through. I know that I watch them. Uh, from time to time on other channels. I like them. I like them a lot. All right. So, the MOL is now favored by the world's top memorizers. For example, it was employed by Lu Chao to recall P, or pi, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter to 67,890 places without error in 2006. Imagine that. You'd definitely not be depressed after that. The MOL also dramatically improves memory performance in naive participants. The more salient, vivid, and bizarre the image linking the material to the location, the easier it is to recollect. And that's from von Reschdorf, for whom we have the name von Reschdorf effect. Similarly, the more emotive the associative imagery, the better the memory for the items. The MOL can be readily used for the temporary storage of information, for example, a shopping list, However, most relevant to its application here is the use of familiar loci as a framework for a more permanent mental repository for material that someone wishes to have easy access to on repeated future occasions. Such repositories are commonly called memory palaces, as they often comprise elaborate and beautiful fictitious locations that the recollector has imagined solely for the purposes of information storage. Memory palaces of this kind have a long pedigree dating back to medieval times. Given the MOL's ease of use as and power as a mnemonic device to facilitate repeated access to material, the current study explored its potential to help those with a history of depression to access self-affirming personal memories of the kind that you, we usually they would usually struggle to recollect. We recruited individuals with major depression disorder that was either in episode or in remission as we felt that the MOL could be helpful regardless of depression status. We nevertheless examined the relationship between remission status and memory performance in our analysis. And there were several important questions to address. Can participants immediately use the memory palace or method of Loki to facilitate access to pre-generated, uh, to a pre-generated set of self-affirming memories that induce positive affect? Can such recollection improve with a small amount of training until it is at or around ceiling? Following training, can recall levels be maintained without further practice? That's a very interesting set of questions, isn't it? Uh, an important consideration was the choice of our control condition. We reasoned that all bona fide forms of memorizing, if applied to a discrete body of material such as pre-identified set of autobiographical memories would improve recollection with training. However, we anticipated that the method of Loki would continue to facilitate 
access to memories even after the training had finished, and it would be in this context that it would demonstrate its superiority over other methods. We therefore selected a control condition, chunking and rehearsal, in which participants underwent a plausible form of memory training that would provide in a comparable immediate and post-training benefits to those accrued using Method of Loki. The effectiveness of chunking and rehearsal as a mnemonic technique is well established, and they are advocated as a memorization as memorization strategies in health and educational settings. So this is kind of bizarre to me because if you're using a memory palace correctly, you're sort of doing some kind of chunking inside of the memory palace anyway, but uh, very interesting. John Nault is in the house from Canada. Always good to meet a fellow Canadian, assuming you're Canadian. Just being in Canada does not necessarily make you a Canadian, although I've read in the Charter of Rights that by virtue of being in Canada, you are in effect Canadian. So nice to meet a fellow Canadian here uh, in the chat. Thanks for saying hello. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the in the chat where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. Let's check in with some of our comments here. Um, Mr. Space says, I'm aware of drama in my head and I like it. Well, hey, man, if that's true, then uh, rock on, rock on. Physical says, my sickness is getting me now. I will go, but my magnetic mentality will keep uh, uh, yourself safe and healthy to be part of the memory tradition much more. People need this. All right. Well, we'll keep bringing it for the people as much as we can. If you guys keep liking it, we'll keep bringing it. Hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the chat if you're watching the replay. Also, leave a comment. Uh, let let me know with your subscribes, of course. Get subscribed if you're not already subscribed to the channel so that... Um, that I know that you're digging it and we'll keep on going. Who here would like more memory science? Like just talking through articles like this. Let me know loud and clear because I always kind of feel like doing it, but I don't know if people would support it, if they would enjoy it, if it would help you as opposed to just reading them uninterrupted on your own. I think uh, this is kind of a cool thing that we can do with the technology to uh, use live streams to just read science memory science. Let me know if that's useful to you and pay attention to this. I'm very, very sensitive to silence. And so when I get crickets, I then decide, uh, nah, they're not interested. I won't do it. But if I get like, hell yeah, then I go, okay, for those people, we, we might have enough of them to do it. Um, but understand that you can vote with silence. You can vote with absolute lack of action. It's just a simple thumbs up and a yes, please. <laughs> Not too much. And know that when you do take those micro steps, those micro actions, you're actually creating the path for the next step, the next step, and the next step. So Chanel says, oui, mon ami. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, John says, originally from Winnipeg, now on Vancouver Island. I love your channel. Oh, thanks for the kind words, John, and great to know about Vancouver Island and... Uh, and Winnipeg. Um, Winnipeg. I've only been there a couple of times, but wow, what a place. What a place. Uh, really interesting. Um, and it looks like uh, you have a great little icon there. John Ritter, it looks like, from uh, Three's Company, amongst other things. He was in It, too, wasn't he? The, the TV version with Tim Curry. Anyway, great if that's who that is, because very, very recognizable. <clears throat> Mr. Space says, yes, please. I enjoy it very much. Christo says, studies and research. Thumbs up. Harry Combeer says, we are interested. Aries says, yes, sir. All right, keep letting me know because your participation makes the difference. And uh, you get more of what you, you support, even with something as simple as saying yes. Um, notice, too, if you're one of those people who actually doesn't do anything, the 80-20 rule is in effect... And if you want to belong to the 80% of people who just are there, then that's what you do. Uh, and if you want to belong to the 20% of people who are excited and take action, those actions lead to further and further actions, even if it takes years. Um, and so this is very, very important to, uh, to think about it. I regret that I was so silent in so many courses myself, so no judgment, but it is a very interesting thing to think about the Price's Law or Pair 2 distribution or 80-20 rule as whatever you want to call it. Um, and think about where you fall into it. And we all fall into it in many, many ways. But it's just bizarre to see how it plays out. And the more I learn about it, the more bizarre it seems. 
And uh, some people even think it's less than 80-20 when it comes to self-improvement. Uh, and I've been now working with memorizing the uh, Bhagavad Gita. And in there, it says, you know, like even less. It's like one in 999 people will actually take action to uh, save their own lives. And that's kind of interesting. I don't know if I believe that. But I think that everybody needs to be sort of aware of that and think about where they are, where they are in a 20% where they're actually motivated taking action, where they are locked in the ocean of inactivity, and how just if they could figure out one little micro step, they would um, they would maybe make all the difference in the world for themselves. So that's pretty important to consider. Hashir is in the house. Good to see you, Hashir, in Karachi, Pakistan. Good to have you. Good to meet with you. Thumbs up for Hashir. Cameron says, love your book on memorizing equations and numbers. How do you feel about photo reading when it comes to memory? I really don't like it. Well, it's not that I don't like it. It, it doesn't exist, right? There's no such thing as photo reading. Not only that, but consider this, Cameron. And great question. Thank you. And thank you for reading that book and, uh, and being active here today. Here's the thing. Photography is a really poor memory for what memory is. Why would we want to um, use words that describe a process that is not only outdated in many ways, but not even doing what we what we want? When we read, right, we don't want to have we don't want to reproduce that material like a photograph. We just want the core information that matters. This is the problem that we see again and again and again. Is that people? They come and they say, I need to memorize this book word for word. I need to memorize 15 chapters word for word for word. Oh, really? No, I don't think so. I've, I've never seen a, con a con condition, a test under which this is actually true. And when I ask people about it, they're like, no, well, basically there's going to be 15 questions, yada, yada, yada. You don't need that. And you're actually setting yourself up for failure when you start to think that you have to memorize everything verbatim. It's not true almost 99% of the time. When is it true? Well, if you're memorizing scripture or something, and even then, you know, wouldn't it make sense to think of things like this? What could I memorize? This is the 80-20 rule again. What would be the 20% of information I could memorize that would push the biggest levers, right? And if you think that way, then you can go and identify what that material is, memorize that, and what's going to happen is your memory is quite good at filling in the blanks. It's good at pattern recognition. It's good at all kinds of things. And so you can actually remember more by remembering less in many, many cases. Not all cases, but many, many cases. And this is really, really important. Also, something that I think that people don't realize, and I didn't even realize until I started to do it almost on a daily basis, is that when you memorize verbatim, you almost get this wormhole effect so, you know, for example, there's a certain, certain words that uh, repeat in the Sanskrit. And so let's say here's a memory palace and this, this station in the memory palace has a particular word in Sanskrit. When it appears again, it's not really the case that you need to like then encode the word again in the next place that it shows up. It's like a wormhole effect. And this little place marker shows you the wormhole. And then you just go there. And uh, because it's already in long-term memory also, you don't even go there. It's hard to explain, but it, a wormhole is sort of what it is. Um, anyway, we could talk more about that, but the, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting effect, how that it works. So, for example, um, and it can happen inside of the same sentence a few times. So there's um, this Sanskrit line that is... Uh, Yanam yatad yanam matam mama. And this yanam is previously memorized somewhere else. And so is yatad somewhere else, right? So um, when it comes time to put it again in another, mem in another memory palace, it's like there's just a marker there and it draws upon the other memory palace without actually drawing it from it. It's just there. Anyway. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. And the cool thing too, and this will answer Mr. Space here about, um, about 80, 20 rule. Okay. So 
let's let's think about what the 80-20 rule is. It, it's used differently in many, many different ways. And so this can confuse people and I might just make it more confusing. <laughs> but there's Price's Law and then there's the pair two principle. And they're basically the same thing. And some people just call it the 80-20 rule. But the basic idea is, is that usually... 80% of results will come from 20% of the effort. So if you look at a company, for example, 80% um, of the revenue will be created by 20% of the employees, and 80% of the employees are basically accomplishing next to nothing. It's kind of like this rule of inefficiency that needs to be there. And uh, I had a friend, Pat was his name, back when I lived in New York City. And uh, he used to say that, you know, democracy has inefficiency built in. And I kind of didn't understand that until I learned the 20% or 80-20 rule. But in any case, so a company, maybe 20% of its employees are responsible for 80% of its revenue. And the rest is just like this inefficient stuff. But is it inefficient? Not necessarily. Because if you think of a farmer's field, right, there may be... Um, only 20% of the field that actually has plants growing on it, but that 80% of the soil in that space surrounding it is what's producing the crop, right? In that 20% of the space. So if we look at something like when people come and they say, oh, I, I need to memorize an entire book, right? Well, do you? Like what happens if you just identify the 20% that would be amazing to have in memory and allow your mind to just sort of fill in the blanks of general knowledge, you're probably better off because first of all, it's more time efficient, but it's also just efficient in the sense that you're only ever going to be called upon in a test to manage 20% of that information anyway. So it matters which 20% you focus on. Um, and you can start to play those kinds of uh, games, so to speak, in order to maximize the time spent and your return on investment will go up because you're leveraging the law of the 80-20 rule. Same thing with like scripture memorization. So in uh, Dancing Beyond Thought, Gary Weber just picks about 60, I think it is, um, verses from the Bhagavad Gita. Not going to memorize the whole thing, just these, uh, just these numbers of, of verses. I'm not even going to memorize all of the ones that he selected. Uh, for various reasons. Some of them are just sort of introductory front matter and uh, he includes them and he memorized them. I saw him do his memory uh, or his demonstration of reciting it. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on the 20% that really means something to me from in there. And, you know, sometimes when I, when I help people with uh, memorizing the Bible and so forth, always I say to them, listen, Instead of putting yourself this goal of memorizing the entire Bible, why don't you think about just the 20% that you think would get you the closest to God? And then just memorize that amount, right? And you could do this by a, um, by a process of identifying it. You don't know in beforehand what that 20% is. Who cares? Just pick something, right? And, uh, you know, go for it, go for it and just do it one line at a time, knowing that because you've been smart about making some kind of choice, narrowing in somehow, everything is going to get you closer to God or to your goal. Now, Aries has an objection here. Thank you for this. The thing is, we don't know what 20% to study. Nonsense. BS. You do know. You do know in multiple ways. Don't trick yourself out of this. Every student has the opportunity to know. First of all, there are, there are professors to go and talk to. There are teachers to go and talk to. Second of all, the uh, department usually has previous year exams. Third of all, there are textbooks. And those textbooks are often designed in ways that students ignore. They're designed to point out the big details. There's things called indexes. There's things called chapter titles. There's things called summaries. It's not that difficult. And people trick themselves into thinking that we don't know what to memorize. Nonsense, a thousand times nonsense. You don't ask. You don't go to the secretary of the department and say, where are the previous exams? Or you don't go to fellow students and students who have been in the class earlier and say, hey, 
do you have a previous exam uh, still on hand that I could look at? You don't even go to the professor or the teacher and say, could you give me an indication of what's most likely to be on here? You don't read the books effectively. You don't look at the, you don't do the sample exercises at the end or whatever, whatever it is. Don't trick yourself out of you don't know what 20% to memorize. You do, and you can find out if you don't. And uh, I really, as a former professor myself, and in some sense, a current professor of memory here in the wild university of the internet, I can tell you that students are very, very disappointing to professors and to teachers when they don't have the wherewithal to simply use what's in front of them. So that's my hard love answer for that. And I don't buy it. I don't buy it for a second. I never have. And I've gone myself and gone to the file folder drawers and looked at and examined previous exams precisely because they are available and they're available not just in one school or two schools or three schools. They're available pretty commonly across the board in many, many schools, almost uh, in some places, I believe, by law. And if they're not, then you can find a way. You can find a way. And it's often just as simple as reaching out to the teacher who's going to give the exam. But people don't do it. There's that 80-20 rule again. You sometimes wonder, why is that person passing all these exams so easily. Well, they probably belong to the 20% who go and talk to the professors, right? Very, very important. Very important. I remember it myself, you know, like as a professor, seeing these people and then you get their tests later and you just know, you, you know they're going to do better because they actually had a discussion with you. They had a dialogue. They had the wherewithal to ask you these questions. And I, uh, I would just often say, and I've had it said to me when I was a student, well, the previous exams are in the department. They're in these full fo file folders. If you have any problem, ask the secretary and that person will help you. So really, really important, really, really important to not trick yourself into thinking you don't, have, you don't know. There's guidance left, right, and center. So much guidance. The books themselves usually have guidance and students ignore it. So uh, point the finger where it belongs, as always, and uh, you will succeed a lot better when you take responsibility take responsibility. All right. And you ask, wouldn't that be 100% though? I don't understand. Where, where are we talking about 100%? We're not talking about 100%. If we're looking at previous exams, those exams will be examining a percentage of the core material, not 100% of it, because you could never make an exam of 100%, unless that you were going to do some sort of thing where you have the students recite every page of the book which is never going to happen except for, you know, some people try to convince me that that's the case. But I, I, I just don't, then I always ask them, well, show me, show me this exam. And they never produce it, even though they say this. All right, let's check in with some of the other parts of the chat. Mr. Space, does that help you with the 80-20 uh, rule? It's pretty, uh, pretty clear. Um, Kyle says, Mr. Space, try to search up drawing Iron Man in 10 minutes versus one minute. You see even with one minute or 20% of time, you see 80% of Iron Man. The rest is just small details like in the 10-minute example. Yeah, that's another. I, I, I haven't seen that, Kyle, but thanks for sharing that. And uh, um, that's a good example. I can imagine it in my mind, exactly how that works out. All right, let's see. We're missing some chats here. Christo says, there are two cars driving side by side, and one makes a small turn to the site. After a long time, they're going to end in totally different directions from the other. Tony Robbins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Uh, Christos asks, do I draw? Yes, I do. Um, let me see if I have some drawings here. I got some of my memory journals on the desk. Not sure if I was in a drawing phase here. Oh, yeah. So here's one. There's a little drawing. <laughs> Probably got some more here. There you go. I'm not really a great artist by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I do like to draw. I probably have some better ones in here. And sometimes I just illustrate stuff from my dreams. There, that's that guy again. But this is like a little a little dream illustration. Um, and I like to draw like abstract things. So there are some drawings. 
I love drawing. I draw, I draw frequently. I have my actual dedicated drawing journals somewhere else. But uh, of course, the most important things you can draw are your memory palaces. And... Well, this is a kind of a, a strange memory palace here. And so on. Yes, I draw. That's the answer to the question. Um, all right. So let's see here. Cameron says, thanks for explaining 8020. What's the most items you've memorized? Well, probably German vocabulary. But uh, beyond that, the Ribhu Gita that I text that I memorize is probably the longest, most extensive extensive part so um and now it's even longer because of memorizing a, a fair amount of the upadesa saram so far and now working on some of the uh, bhagavad gita <clears throat> and so i don't know how far i'm going to take that adventure in memorizing verbatim sanskrit but i can imagine it getting up to several hundred pages for sure um and it's surprisingly fun and easy to do so why not keep going uh, Mr. Space says, yes, it did help a lot. Thank you. You are informative about your advice. That's why I enjoy your live streams. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the world, where in the world you are. Say hello in the chat. Ask any questions. Let's read a bit more of this. So an important consideration was the choice of our control condition. We reasoned, I already read a bit of this, but let's, um, Let's uh, repeat it here. We reasoned that all bona fide, bona fide forms of memorizing, if applied to a discrete body of material, such as pre-identified set of autobiographical memories, would improve recollection with training. However, we anticipated that the method of Loki Losi Losi would continue to facilitate access to memories even after the training had finished. And it would be in this context that it would demonstrate its superiority over other methods. We therefore selected a control condition, chunking and rehearsal, in which participants underwent a plausible form of memory training that would provide comparable intermediate and post-training effects to those accrued using method of Loki. The effectiveness of chunking and rehearsal as a mnemonic technique is well established, and they are advocated as memorization strategies in health and educational settings. So we read that, and again, Chunking is kind of strange how they think that it's not part of what happens in a memory palace, but let's carry on and see where this goes. The method of Loki and rehearsal training regimes followed the same structure with an initial face-to-face -face session with the experimenter to generate the memories, learn the respective memory technique, and assess recall of the memory set using the allocated technique. Uh, so the, this is time one recall pre-training. This was followed by the training, which comprised short sets of memory practice on the same memories homework over a one-week period prior to a second session uh, assessing recall of the practice memories. Uh, so participants then completed a surprise recall test one week after the second session to uh, reassess memory recall. Although we anticipated that both research, rehearsal and method of Loki Loci Loci would be effective in facilitating retention when initially applied, we predicted that both techniques would improve recall further via training to, at, or near ceiling. Our key prediction, however, was that recall in the method of Loki Loci Loci condition would be maintained on the follow-up surprise recall test because of the ability to use the Loki to access the memories relative to a significant decrement in recall at follow-up in the rehearsal condition. We anticipated that this would be true even after controlling for any training-related gains in memory performance. Uh, from time one to time two, showing that it was not simply a carryover of differential training effects. And I wonder why that uh, training effect would be a problem. In any case, let's see here. Kyle says, fun question. Have you ever thought it's possible for memory palace inception, like filling a station in a memory palace with another memory palace, like for elite people? I'm not sure what you mean by elite people, but yes, you can create memory palaces inside of memory palaces, and uh, there's a number of ways to do it, but I'm not sure exactly what you mean by elite people. Do you mean like super rich people where we would somehow in inject into their brains this sort of stuff? Well, if you were on one of the previous live streams, we saw that rich, rich people play all kinds of games like that, and... Um, Rich people. <laughs> elite people. I've had enough of elite people, I think. I'm not sure what makes them so elite. 
Aren't we the elite? We're here. We care about memory. Thumbs up to us. <laughs> we are the memory elite. Insofar as such such uh, worldly laurels are even worth having. Let's just enjoy without any of the uh, social stratification. All right, so the method, 42 participants at a mean age of 45.67 years with uh, MDD, okay, so with some sort of depression, either an episode or remission, were recruited via advertisements in local newspapers and health centers. D depression diagnosis and history and other current access one psychiatric comorbidity according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Men Mental Disorders, also known as the dsm 4 at the time of this article, were determined using the structured clinical interview for the dsm 4 administered by AG, a postdoctoral health psychologist. Prior reliability training on the presence, absence of the SCID Axis 1 diagnosis, diagnoses between AG and TD with 28 separate patients resulted in complete agreement. Exclusion criteria were a current diagnosis of substance dependence, a history of psychosis, or organic brain injury. No participants were excluded. So, I don't understand this. They're going to exclude people with psychosis? Not sure why. Um, in any case, following SCID assessment, participants were randomly allocated to the MLL or rehearsal condition using a minimization procedure stratified for presence or absence of a current depressive episode. So I wonder, maybe they'll talk about what this minimization procedure was, but materials and measures, self-report measures. So in session one, participants provided written informed consent and completed the Beck depression inventory, a widely used and well-validated measure of depressive symptoms over the previous week a widely used index of verbal IQ that is relatively immune to changes in mental state. The BDI was repeated in session two. These measures were included to evaluate the comparability of the two groups at baseline and to evaluate any impact of training on depressive symptoms. All right. Um, for both conditions, memory training comprised two face-to-face sessions with an experimenter, the same person for all participants of around one hour each scheduled a week apart and either side of three short 15 to 20 minute home-based sessions. In the first face-to-face -face session, following completion of the NART and BDI, participants were given as long as they needed, typically 30 to 40 minutes, to generate 15 positive and self-affirming autobiographical memories with the assistance of the experimenter. The emphasis was on generating memories that they would wish to be able to access with relative ease during times of low mood or distress that were particularly difficult to access easily in such states. The experimenter worked with the participants to enrich and elaborate the memories, using imagery and a focus on the specific and concrete details of the original events. These would be the memories that participants would practice with during the training. Participants then compiled a short phrase as a tag for each memory so that it could be readily identified during recall. Following memory generation, participants rated each memory on a number of dimensions. More importantly, we asked participants to rate the extent to which thinking about the memory recalled in this way had a positive impact on their current mood. This allowed us to verify that contemplating these memories had effective benefits and to ensure comparability across groups, we also asked participants to use a four-point Likert type scale to answer the question, how often do you think about the memory and to record the age of each memory? Oh, the age of each memory. That's interesting. So some of these finer points in the parentheses is that there's a 10 point Likert type scale from neutral to extremely positive, And they had ranging from not at all to often on a four point scale. All right. But this aging of memory, that's interesting. That suggests kind of a, an interesting exercise you could do. When memory comes up, you could just ask yourself instantly, how old is this memory? And try and figure out the year and so forth. Amsal's in the house. Good to see you, Amsal. Thanks for saying hello. Always good to see you here when we are seeing your comments and uh, wonderful. If you're just joining us, let me know where you are in the world. Hit the thumbs up and uh, get involved. So there's an interesting thing to do. If you have memories, just ask, how old are they? How old are they? 
So, you know, I can think of, um, it's just, you know, an older girlfriend came to my older girlfriend. She's older now, but a previous girlfriend came to mind and I can just instantly think what were the years of that relationship. That's kind of a cool little quick memory exercise. Um, or, you know, what would have been the year that I got this or that book or whatever that just comes to mind. That's kind of cool. I can see great power in that exercise, just as like a brain exercise. MOL training. Following memory generation, the MOL participants were introduced to the MOL technique. The advantage of creating emotive and salient associations between to-be-remembered items and Loki was emphasized. Participants were taken through a worked example of a shopping list using familiar London landmarks as Loki, Loki, Loki. That's interesting. So they're building the memory palace together. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? For example, to remember the item milk, it was suggested that they might imagine a torrent of milk gushing out of a lion statue's mouth in Trafalgar Square, splashing everywhere and forming a lake. Participants practiced with items on the list until they were happy with the technique. So I wonder if they actually took them to these locations or they assumed that these people knew them and got them to access it in their minds. Interesting. See, sometimes they just don't have enough details to what, what they actually did in these studies. Participants next identified their own uh, magnetic stations, let's call them this time, along either along a familiar route, for example, the journey to work, or within a familiar location, for example, their childhood home. They practiced recalling the magnetic stations several times by mentally journeying around them until they expressed confidence in remembering the 15 locations. Participants then worked with the experimenter to form appropriate associations between the Loki and the previously generated set of memories. For example, one participant in the main study had generated a memory of an important conversation over coffee in New York with her best friend. She associated the memory with the front of her childhood home, one of her selected Loki, by imagining the fascia of the house transformed into an outlet of a popular U.S. coffee chain with her friend standing outside smiling and dressed as a barista. Another participant selected the birth of his daughter as one of the memories. He associated it with a red UK post box on his journey to work by imagining his daughter as a baby lying peacefully in a crib balanced on top of the post box. Once participants reported that they had formed associations with which they were happy, they were given a blank recall sheet and asked to use the Loki to access the memories, the 15 memories, without access to their notes. Following the recall test, participants filled in any memories and or loci they had not been able to remember after consulting their notes. The home-based tasks were comprised of three 8 to 10 minute exercises over the following week. Participants began each exercise by using their notes to remind themselves of their loci and memories and then, without notes, mentally navigating their chosen loci, bringing each memory fully and richly to mind as they did so, writing down the memory tags. If they could not remember certain locations and or memories, then they could use their notes to remind themselves of the ones they had forgotten at the end of the exercise. After each exercise, participants rated, how long did you spend practicing your route in minutes? And how easily were you able to keep within the 10 minute time frame using a seven point Likert type scale from not at all to very easily. After the final exercise, participants rated, how closely did you follow the instructions and practice your route and learn your memories using the MOL technique? Using a seven point Likert type scale from not at all closely to very closely. And how easy have you found it to learn your memories using the MOL technique? Using a seven point uh, Likert type scale from not at all to very easy, uh, easily. These ratings were included to check comparability across the two training conditions and to provide feasibility data. In the second face-to-face -face session, participants were asked to mentally retrace the route around their loci, fully generating as many of the memories as they could without notes and recording them. Then they filled in any memories and or loci they had not been able to remember. Participants were paid an honorarium and consent was elicited for phone contact regarding participation in future research into memory. For the follow-up recall test, Participants were phoned one week after the second session and asked, using a standardized script, to try to recall the 15 memories with which they had been working. They were given no prompts apart from this. They were then also asked whether they had been rehearsing the memories in the previous week using the MOL, and if so, 
how often. Interesting, interesting. All right. So, Mr. Space says, wow, this is something new to ask how old is my memory. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing thing, just as a little habit to get into. Um, Crystal says, might have done them a simple demonstration or something for these palaces. Yeah, yeah. Crystal says, this is the weird memory I heard of. <laughs> John says, I can recall most years of my life. It's a strange thing to recall the years certain things happened. I'm always the one people go to recall the month year and so got married uh, and so and so got married and died, etc. Great, great that you have that. Um, it's interesting to think about why that might be the case. Is there something you do in your mind that you may not have thought about before? And maybe you can track it in the future and just see, like maybe you're not aware of having ever done anything in your mind, but maybe you do. And so um, without, you know, some conscious, self-conscious observation, it may be that you never notice that there's actually a process involved in this, or it may just happen naturally. But usually there's often something that, that these people do. Same thing with like the speculations about hyperthemesia. It's not clear that this is actually just happening on autopilot. Um, more studies need to take place. All right, so the pilot study. To examine its feasibility for autobiographical material, we piloted this MOL protocol with 12 unselected participants and recruited from the department volunteer panel. All participants could generate 15 self-affirming memories that they reported as having a beneficial effect on mood Participants showed good immediate recollection after applying the MOL. Recall, recall was further improved by training over a week with 9 of 12 participants able to recall 15 memories. Most importantly, recall, 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 total recall seemed to be maintained above time. One levels at follow-up, again with 9 of 12 participants at ceiling. There were no dropouts, and all participants reported completing all three homework assignments. In sum, the pilot study suggested that MOL training was feasible and acceptable and facilitated access to the target memories, at least in the small unselected sample. Great. So this is um, very, very interesting. Let's do an exercise. Who wants to participate in an exercise? Let me know. Who's excited for an exercise? Exercise time. Type, type, type. Are you interested in an exercise? I have an exercise idea. I have an exercise idea. Do, 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 do. Who is interested? Who is interested? I'm already thinking. Uh, Crystal says, me. Awesome. And you say, people with savantism has it too. All right. C. Dolls is in the house. Thank you for that smile. I don't know if that means yes, but um, here's the thing. Either privately or publicly if you want and type it in, share it in. I'll do some too. Here's what this study did. 15 happy memories. 15 happy memories, right? Let's see. I'm going to come up with 15 happy memories right now. Let's see if you can too. Go ahead. Feel free to type in at least one happy memory, right? Let's see if the 80-20 rule is in effect here. We got a certain number of people on the chat. Let's see. If we see the 80-20 rule play out in terms of people sharing their um, happy memories, you put as many as you want. You can go more than 15, and I would just say number them, one, etc. So the first happy memory that comes to my mind is playing with the outside. And there was one particular concert where we decided to play a song from the new album that we weren't sure was going to work live on stage and uh we just nailed it and the, you know when you're playing in a band the first time that you play a song live is just kind of just like you don't know if it's going to connect with audience and sometimes the songs that you just love that are so amazing in the studio or so amazing on the album they just don't work live and you don't know why they just don't right but this one was just like and it was just like boom it just and the other thing too is it was um almost the last concert on the tour and uh we were on home turf back in berlin and it was just amazing everybody was there you know that had seen us for many many years 
And uh, now the trick is, is to make a memory palace where this is going to now be the first memory in a memory palace that's a positive memory to just go back and visit. So we need a 15 station memory palace, right? My pencil isn't going to make do this justice, but, um, oh, Rasmus is in the house. Good to see you, Rasmus. Thanks for saying hello. If you're joining us, as always, say hello. Um, normally, I use a pencil only in my little memory journal, but um, can I get 15 stations in this uh, in this concert hall since it was the first memory? When you take your first memory, look at that. The 80-20 rule isn't even alive. No one has shared a memory yet. Interesting. Um are you awake out there? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to use the, since the first memory is in this concert hall in Berlin, I think I can get 15 stations in there. And so it'll be like a meta memory, memory palace. So yeah, I got to do it this way. Yeah, like this. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Um, I think I can just deal with this. Maybe I'll just do that. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to draw the stage here. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15. Okay, so this is actually a little bit tight in this uh, corridor area, but we can work with it. And the first station is here. So notice it's it's completely linear like that. And I've got the stage here. And the, the stage is like where the drum is, where I'd be standing, and uh, where the guitar player would be standing. I could actually put the singer in there. I should have put him in there. Oh, sorry, Roland. That would make this easier. But he moved around so much. The rest of us, we were pretty, pretty stable. All right, so we don't need a station for the first memory palace because the memory palace is the memory, is the memory. Christos says, real memory or fiction? Mine would be buying a really expensive car. Great, great. Um, well, obviously, I think uh, it should be a real memory. If it's a, if it's fiction, then keep it. You know, if you if you don't want to share uh, anything, that's fine. But um, the point is to complete the exercise, right? If you don't complete the exercise, then you're not going to get the benefit. Um, so that was my first memory. Let's check in with the chat. Uh, Christos is asking, where is the crowd? The crowd is right here in the center. And, uh, you know, that's a good question because I can remember some people like my girlfriend and I could turn where she was in the audience. My former girlfriend better said, um, this is an interesting thing, actually, this whole thing of the, the former girlfriend coming to mind and so forth. Like, that caused a lot of pain in my brain for a long time. But I totally got peace with it. Um, and part of it's from using memory palaces just to gain peace with it. So when we talk about these categories of memory that we talked about earlier today, uh, and you can check out the replay if you, you, you want to catch up on that. Um by just uh, just allowing myself to use the apartment we lived in as a memory palace and and even just now thinking about how wow that was pretty cool how she came to that concert and she was so into it and bam 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 you know really neat it was certainly a lot better than one of my previous girlfriends before that who was always jealous at these concerts cuz you get a certain attention when you're the person on the stage and uh she was always super jealous neurotically so anyway let's check in with uh some of these uh, chats here. So Cidal says, visiting the art museum in OK, loved the statues. So I'm not sure where OK is, Oklahoma or or where, but very, very cool. Okinawa, maybe. Great, we got one memory. So the 80-20 rule is not even in effect. Oh, two, sorry, we got two, because we had one from Christos. Um, and that car was probably a great memory palace in and of itself. All right. Um, so Rasmus says, getting admission to university, studying my favorite field of study is the first big happy memory that comes to mind. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. 
Christo says, building more memory palaces makes you create more interesting memories, binds up that this treats the scarcity element. Yeah, yeah. No need for memory palace uh, scarcity. None whatsoever. There's no need for memory palace scarcity. Um, okay, so I got one. What's the next happy memory that comes to mind? Oh, taking the ferry to Sweden. Taking ferry to Sweden. It was the first time I went to Sweden and absolutely loved it. I believe every time that I've gone to Sweden, I've taken the ferry. <laughs> but I love that memory. What a beautiful memory. So now I got two. Kyle says, sorry, I'm driving, can't share. Oh, well, Kyle, thanks for saying hello. But yeah, please, uh, as, as uh, you know, you just be safe, be safe. I hope you're typing as you have only when you're um, stopped at a, at a light. Really, really uh, important. Um, but yeah, you can always uh, come back and post in the in the discussion after if you like. Marichella's in the house. Good to see you, Marichella. We're doing a memory exercise. You might want to join us. If you're just joining us now, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing. I've got two memories now out of 15 that we're trying to generate. And we're looking also, we're studying the 80-20 rule <laughs> and seeing uh, it play out before our very eyes. Um, CDAW says, finishing 5K in under 11 minutes. Saravan is in the house. I'm lucky to watch this live streaming just an hour back. I subscribed to you, sir. Thanks for guiding us. Thanks for being here, Saravan. Thanks for saying hello. And Andrew is here. Thanks for saying hello, Andrew. Good to see you here. Hello, Anthony. Just started memory palaces. I want to know, do they work for maths and sciences and formulas? Yeah, Andrew, absolutely. You know, um, the, a few weeks back, I memorized some numbers in a formula. K equals constant, what was it now? Uh, 8, 9, 9 times 10 cat sign 9. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what that was. And that's maybe a month ago now. Um, <laughs> and... I don't know if anybody was here who was there to uh, fact check that, that what I just recalled is there. But yes, absolutely you can. And you can find uh, some of those. I didn't memorize which live stream it was on, but you can find some earlier live streams where I memorized some numbers and so forth. Um, but yeah, great question. And yes, Andrew, you absolutely can. Um, you want to learn something called the major system or the major method. And you can find that to learn on magneticmerrymethod.com or you can get my book on math and numbers for the book like treatment or you can just take the course in the magnetic merry method masterclass but start with the um start with the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash yt which i will give you the link for oh i gotta get the link for you and i'll put it in the chat so you can Grab it directly from here. It may open a new tab for you or whatever it's going to do. And enjoy. It'll help you. Um, you need this basis. I, I highly recommend you get this basis before you go to the major because it'll actually help you memorize the major in the first place. All right. So, um, Yogesh says, feels difficult to convert economic terms into images such as interest rate, tax rates, inflation rates. Please give suggestions. Yogesh, thanks for that. Let me know what feels difficult. Describe this difficulty. We need specifics. We always work from specifics. We can't generalize. Generalization gets us nowhere. All right. And as we go on, I'm going to add a third memory here. So I got um, the first memory. Oh, I, I didn't place. See, earlier we were talking about, um, uh, I think it was... Um, Kyle was asking, can you put a memory palace inside of a memory palace? Well, here's a way to do that. Um, okay, so my first station in the memory palace now is this trip to Sweden on the ferry. So I can actually put that ferry cabin on the first station. And if I just make it dead simple, four corners of the ferry cabin, maybe I can use the little window bay for a fifth one or whatever. Maybe I can use the bed. Why not? Um now there's a memory palace inside the memory palace. So this is a cool exercise. All of you guys who aren't uh, participating in it, I don't know if you are or not. Maybe you're doing it in your mind, but it's better done on paper or, or typing in. You're missing out on an exercise that can help you build 
potentially 15 or 16 memory palaces. Third idea that comes to mind is when I got my PhD. So PhD, I'll never forget that. Victor Vitanza, he was the external external telling me, he's like, dude, the only guy cooler than you is Miles Davis. And this was, he said this because normally when people are under so much attack, like I was uh, under attack, he said, usually when that happens, the the uh, student is in tears and you handled that like a champ and uh, and like really well. And I just thought, oh, well, meditation, my friend, <laughs> meditation plus memory. But it was pretty, it was pretty brutal, I have to admit. All right. So there's the PhD. And so now we got to place it in the memory palace. So we got that, we got that. And that's another memory palace, that room. I'm just going to put that room there. So that's another four stations at least. I could actually use the body of each and every person on the examination committee as uh, as as who was there. Yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. Actually, the public was there also. So I don't remember exactly how many people were from the public. But if I just use the examiners, there's seven examiners in total. Nice, nice, nice. All right. So, and it was a complicated memory, but a good one in the end because I emerged victorious against all the odds and got me my PhD. All right. So, Crystal says, let's build on the concert mind palace. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here. So, now we've got memory palaces inside of memory palaces, and that's the first two stations. And now we can go to station three. So, this whole memory palace is itself playing this concert with the outside. Then station one right here is the ferry trip to Sweden. And then number two is now where I was in, it was in Vanier College at York University where uh, I got my PhD. So now that's inside of here. And uh, nobody else has any, is your life this, this, this uh, absent of amazing things? Please. Let me know. Um, and I would love to have your happy memories here, or at least know that you're participating or participate later. Obviously, if you're driving, don't. But uh, I was, when I thought of this, I was uh, hoping that you would all just be like flooding the gates with uh, your happy memories, the amazing things that have happened in your life. Where are they? Um, the 80 20 rule isn't even in effect. Shocking. Shocking indeed. Unless you're all driving. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> and you are in the crowd, Christos. But I need an image. I need to see a, a picture of you. Um, otherwise, I got to go with, like, Christ on the cross. Um, so make sure when you send a Magnetic Mary Method testimonial with your picture, that would be awesome. Maybe the picture with you in your expensive car. What kind of car was it? That must be an amazing memory palace. All right. So fourth memory now. Um, hmm. What would come to mind? Oh, when I got this base. Base acquisition. Yeah. That was nice. That was fun. So what happened was... This beauty here, I got when I was in uh, Lille in Paris to see the 20th anniversary full album playthrough of um, Rust in Peace by Megadeth. And it's kind of a fun memory because these guys saw me in the guitar store beforehand and uh, they were like, are you in the band opening for Megadeth tonight? Because I was just ripping it up. And... Uh, <laughs> This is quite a compliment. So not only did I know I had to buy the bass, but um, it was it was just a nice compliment. I'm not really an egotistical person uh, insofar as, you know, really caring, but it was just nice, a nice moment. And it, it was a blessing to the bass. All right. Do, 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 do. So there's uh, another memory, the bass acquisition. And I had that bass on the stage with me in this memory palace. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, let's check in with our chat here. Kyle says, is the major method example video for the number 75? I think you said Carl, but isn't the R make it 745? Um, 
this is an interesting this is an interesting thing. It does perhaps, but not necessarily, because something like Carol would be more uh, 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 that. So it depends on how you organize it. Good question, Kyle. But um, it depends on how you organize it. So you can have the first and last num uh, last consonant do the work, and then it doesn't really matter what comes in between. Or you can have this sort of um, seven four five. So in the case of a seven four five, I would use a carol. And in this case, you're kind of um, you know you just got to remember these things. But the more you use these things, the more you'll be fine, and the more you refine your images over time. So that Carl example, you know, could certainly be updated because now um, I uh, use John Kale for 75. I've updated it. And that's a very, very important update. And it sort of also removes that sort of confusion for example purposes for others. But in your own practice, it should never be confusing. If you're confused, then um, you need to change it. But the fact that others might, you know, logically think that through just as a sign of their brilliance and their personal intelligence. But um, it is uh, it is something to just consider is that what you do to break the rules is not breaking the rules if it's effective for you. It's just if you do things that um, trip you up, then you need to correct it and, and work on improving it. All right, Snahal is in the house. Good to see you, Snahal. Thanks for saying hello. How to forget bad memories. Well, that's what we're talking about today. And uh, I really don't recommend forgetting them. I recommend working with them so they no longer have the sting. And that's what we thats what we, we were talking about. I'm sorry you got to us late, but you can always go back and watch the replay. And I hope that you, uh, you will and uh, leave any questions that you have. But essentially... That's what we're talking about today. And one of the things that you can do is just compile more good memories using a memory palace, which is what this study is about. And it's the exercise we're doing now. But interestingly, we're not getting much activity. So I don't think I'm going to continue much further um, pumping in all my good memories uh, without you know some back and forth. But um, interesting, interesting that there just isn't this abundance of pleasurable memories pouring in. Interesting. So Savenk says, magician show, I think 20 years ago, and it was really unforgettable. I can even remember the person's face sitting beside me. Oh, that's good. Magic show. Thank you. That gives me another one. I remember seeing Mr. Dress Up. Awesome. Awesome. See, this is what I would hope is that people would trigger happy ma memories for each other. But in order to do that, we need to um, actually share. But um, I don't know if anybody knows Mr. Dress Up from Canada. Ernie Coombs was his real name. Anyway, he was like the Canadian Mr. Rogers. Looks like we're getting a couple uh, more coming in. Yogesh says, I have used the word inflation in Loki and I uh, used a balloon growing in size. Rates rhymes with rake. Could do a growing balloon being raked. Whoa, that's a cool image. Nice, nice. CDOS has number three. Oh, you're keeping up, CDOS. Excellent, excellent. Road trip to New Mexico. Awesome. Is Albuquerque in New Mexico? I think so. Um, I'd love to go see that place. All right. So Mr. Dress Up comes to mind. Number six. Let me see. Um, Seving says, for me, it's better to solve the bad memories and don't replay. Yeah, I mean, I think if you do solve them, they will tend to not replay them. But I think, you know, Freud talked about the return of the repressed. So if we if we repress them, then they can just grow bigger and more monstrous. Um, so, uh, we need to, uh, consider that, um, that we want to, uh, you know, deal with them so that if they do come back, they don't have any sting. Cause at the end of the day, how would we ever know if they're never coming back? You can't know if they're never coming back. So you need to settle on a different, um, process. You need to settle on a feeling you need to work on a feeling that you're okay if it does come back gary good to see you thanks for saying hello glad that you're using the magnetic mary method thanks for letting us know awesome to see that people are uh, on facebook and joining us excellent excellent so um love to know more if you care to share about what you're uh, doing with uh, your memory and uh, good to see you here so 
Um, Crystal says, when I got my treadmill at home. That's a great memory. Awesome, awesome. Sivink says, to give bad memories, deepness and touch will hurt. And yes, we have to solve it first. All right. Well, yeah. Uh, but, you know, again, I could only stress the point is that we don't get to know whether a memory is coming back or not. So the real game is to be cool with it coming back so that it doesn't hurt us or harm us anymore, even if it if it is present. All right. So memory number six. I, I, I think that this would be good to, to complete, but I might complete it in private, and you guys can all complete yours in private as well. But um, six is such a great number. Let's see if we can think. Oh, getting married. That's one. Getting married in Denmark, of all places. Wow. Copenhagen. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So I like that. Anyway, the point of the exercise is to have, I don't know why that in this study they had 15, but to have a memory palace with 15 stations and then 15 positive memories that you then can go through when you're feeling depressed to help you um, help you do this. So CDOS says, purchasing my first car. Okay, I'm going to put my first car too. My first car, 1964 blue Volkswagen Beetle. My first car. Yeah, that was awesome. It was pretty sad how I wrecked it, though. Oops. <laughs> Long story. We won't put that on our list. So thank you for triggering that idea. And uh, see if I can think. Oh, my first sitar. I remember my first sitar. That was awesome memory. And let's see. What a day. What a beautiful day. It's so hot here in Australia. Where are you guys all? Is it hot where you're at or are you cold? Let me know in the chat. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up and uh, let me know where you're at. William is at work, but one of my favorite memories is lying in a hammock on Coconut Beach, Cambodia, feeling totally relaxed. It's a holiday in Cambodia. <laughs> you know that song, William? <laughs> well, yeah, keep focused on your work, but thanks for saying hello and sharing that. That's beautiful. Um, see now what we can do in this kind of shared group exercise is we can then think of hammocks in our life. And I'm thinking, where was I on a hammock and, uh, trying to figure out hammocks and one is coming, one is coming. I feel the hammock that I've been on and enjoyed. It's just not quite coming, but I'm going to keep on focusing on it and, um, seeing if a hammock comes to mind, but great, great suggestion. Um, CDOS says, 2008 bright yellow smart car. Still have it. Christos, what happened to your car? Well, <laughs> we're going to get, we need some more participation from people with their stories if you want to hear that story, because that's epic what happened to my car. <laughs> oh, man, what a memory that is. What an idiotic kid I was. If you want to hear that, let's hear some more of your happy memories. Um, William agrees, yes, it's hot. Harry says, playing in a guitar store and the owner of the shop started to play with me on his contrabass. Nice. See, now that brings a memory, Harry, immediately. I remember being in Beijing and playing guitar with these dudes there. And uh, they were just like, whoa, man. Like, I guess they just didn't see people who were just like ripping out heavy metal like that. And then they were just like ripping out some Chinese heavy metal I hadn't heard before. And I was like, what? And so uh, that's a great memory. Thanks. You just triggered an amazing memory. Thanks for that. Eric says, cold here in D.C. Got to pull out the Henry Rollins, man. <laughs> or Minor Threat or Fugazi or something. That'll warm you up. I was just listening to Fugazi the other day. Oh, there's another one. I remember getting to see Fugazi in Toronto. Yeah, what was that concert hall called? It was on Parliament. I guess it was called Parliament. Um, Fugazi concert. And they had this bell... Oh, it was amazing. I'm not sure who opened for them. And it was really weird because I saw a guy from that I went to high school in BC, in, in Toronto, like in all places. Oh, what a great memory. I miss that guy. What, what, I miss him. He had a Honda Civic. I remember that in school. Green. Awesome, awesome. All right. So, Marichelle says, Memories of all kinds. I write poems or prose. It helps me. In McCollin, it's 50 to 60 degrees so it's cold for me 
All right. Well, I wish I was cold as some of you guys. <laughs> Not really. I like the heat. I like it a lot. CDOS, five, earning bachelor's degree. Nice. Kyle says, my good memory was getting an A in class. Awesome, Kyle. Eric says, Danny Gatton. All right. I oh, from, from Bad Brains. Yeah, I, you know, I never really listened to band, Bad Brains. Uh, I got to get into that. They've been through some of the towns that I've been many times, but I never went to see them and I never just quite got into them. I think that they um, were always so loud somehow. Not that I don't like loud, uh, but they bring into, they bring to memory. Did you ever hear, uh, what were they called? SNFU? I remember playing a concert with SNFU and they were, uh, they were bizarre. <laughs> they were strange. Chai Pig was the, I don't know his real name, but the singer always went by the name Chai Pig. <laughs> and I remember DOA was also, oh no, I didn't play at that concert. I was just um, involved in the production uh, and the promotion. But uh, they, they uh, played with DOA and uh, Chai Pig insisted on having two flats of not beer it was weird it was not beer it was cream soda and 12 pairs or a number of pairs of lumberjack you know like socks or whatever you call those wool woolly socks <laughs> they had to have a red stripe and everything and then he wanted um uh frozen hot dogs and spray cheese and a badminton racket <laughs> And so it was all on his rider. He had to have them or he wasn't going on stage. And I don't know what he did with the cream soda. I don't know what he did with the socks, but I'll never forget that when they were playing, he, <laughs> he had these frozen hot dogs and the badminton racket and he would throw up the badminton racket, hit the hot dog into the audience and try to hit the hot dog in the air with this spray on cheese. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. What a nutcase. Then I saw SNFU years later in Frankfurt with No Means No. Great band, No Means No. And uh, he was much more calm. <laughs> anyway, there's a documentary about Chai Pig uh, that came out. It was pretty sad. I don't know if he's still alive. He's got huge problems. All right. So Crystal says doesn't have many traveling related memories. I got tons. I got tons. I'll never forget the first time flying into Europe. Wow. Amazing memory. There, I'm going to write that down. Flying into Europe. Air Canada. There is a practically empty plane. Amazing. Had to fly into um, Zurich before going to, to Berlin on a much smaller plane. And I remember that too. This is the first time I've ever been on this really, really small plane and all of a sudden there's Germans everywhere and <laughs> they're eating these little sandwiches on the plane instead of the North American style nuts and whatever they give you there. Unbelievable. All right. So I'm up to 11 memories. Oh, I'll never forget. Speaking of music, all these, see this, these exercises trigger memories. So I hope they're triggering for you as well. Beautiful memories, but I'll never forget also, um, having dinner with one of the guys from Einstürzende Neubauten, which is a German band. Anybody know Einstürzende Neubauten? If you don't, you got to hear this one song at least, if not all their songs. Weil, 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 so ist es. Weil, 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 wie immer. Weil, 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 immer weil. It's so geil. <laughs> Der Hammer. Um, anyway, uh, really beautiful uh, music. And he came over for dinner because my previous wife was like friends with him for years and years and years. And it was just this amazing thing. Cause when I was a, a kid, I used to hear there in Canada, there was a radio show called brave new waves. And I used to hear, uh, bands like this and Einstürz and Neubauten and they were featured and learned about all these bands that influenced them like Faust and so forth. And then, you know, skinny puppy and, and, and anyway, amazing, amazing. And then one day this guy's actually like having, having dinner <laughs> and then you know just then i just used to see him all the time in berlin it was amazing and i actually saw blixa bargill one time on the street in berlin also and uh it was like i don't know I, I got used to it living in new york you just see famous people and 
you'd have this sort of weird thing where they know that you know who they are. And uh, they're just like, oh, it's weird. It's hard to explain. Like I remember seeing Keanu Reeves on the street one time. He was like heavily sort of guarded. But the one um, Ethan Hawke I saw one time and uh, that was the weirdest thing. He was just by himself. And it's like this, I know that you know who I am. I don't know who you are. I just know that you know who I am. And you're either going to talk to me or you're not. And how's this going to go? <laughs> it's just the weirdest thing. Anyway, I remember seeing Blitz of Bargel at one time on the street in Berlin. And uh, just as I was about to say, hey, I know, uh, I know Andrew um, and, and introduce myself because he knows my former wife very, very well. Uh, his phone rang and I was just like, hi. And uh, it, so I just seemed like another guy who recognized him on the street. But um, in any case... That's uh, interesting memories that come up. So semi-meeting. So number 12 for me is uh, Andrew Dinner. And 13 will be sort of meeting Blixabar Gilt. <laughs> what a funny memory that is. And what a great name, Blixabar Gilt. So I got to go to my 14th memory now. And I think you guys are going to trigger a memory. C Dawes says dancing with the girlfriend at senior prom. What was her name? Kelly. I danced with Kelly. That was huge. The other thing that happened in my senior prom was that I'd actually dropped out of high school. <laughs> and I just went to the graduation to see my friends graduate. And my friend's mom, she saw me and she said, what the heck are you doing? As a, You dropped out? What the heck? Because she said, oh, congratulations on graduating. I was like, ah, I'm not actually graduating. I dropped out like six months ago, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, what are you doing? You could be a professor. You're exactly the kind of person who should not only have your high school degree, but go to university and don't stop until you've reached the highest pinnacle. And she really berated me and just, that's the moment that I decided that I would go back to school, get my high school degree and go back to university. And she appeared in my life many times after that and was always a great inspiration because she had a PhD and uh, it was cool that I could hang out at my friend's house um, and see all of these books, these academic books that she had. And just an absolutely incredible person. Absolutely. C. Dawes says, meeting girlfriend for the first time. Awesome. So I'm also going to put uh, that moment. That was really the call to adventure. She was the Merlin. And I said yes to the call. Amazing. I went back to high school. It was so embarrassing to go back to high school. Uh, strangely enough, it was not embarrassing to go to the to the final prom and to go to the graduation ceremony and see my friends graduate. But uh, it was super embarrassing to actually have to go back and sit in class. And the previous year was there. And, 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 and. But I did it. Got it done. And then I never stopped till I had my PhD. And even while I was in my PhD, I was so getting good with the memory techniques that I went and got a second MA. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Let's see here. So Christo says, when I discovered my favorite metal band, I was hooked blasting the tune so loud. I felt like going to war. <laughs> yeah. Well, they choose those, uh, those warlike tones for sure. C -Daw, C Daw says, Dad makes handmade bicycles, and I got to see how happy he was at his first show. Awesome, awesome. Marichelle says, raining all day, had a fryer drill, 30 minutes. Nothing romantic, but laughing and kidding with the students. Awesome, awesome. Excellent, excellent. So, Crystal says, well, you do a meme review. Get PewDiePie to invite me. I'm in. <laughs> I'll do it with PewDiePie. But yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't know where he, I don't even know where he finds the memes for meme review, but uh, I suppose I could do a meme review, but I'd rather do it with him. That's for sure. <laughs> I don't think I don't think I'm getting invited anytime soon, but you never know. Maybe PewDiePie's here right now. Hit the thumbs up if you're here, PewDiePie. Say hello. Um, that's the weird thing. You never know who's on these things. You never know. You never know. All right. So let's carry on with this. Um, rehearsal training. This followed the same structure and used the same ratings as the MLO, MLO, MOL training, with the exception that participants received instruction, instruction on chunking and rehearsal of memories in session one, practicing first with a short list of items as per the MOL protocol, and then applying the method to their own memories. 
With the help of the experimenter, participants were encouraged to group the memories into higher order sets based on regularities across the events in order to aid subsequent recollection. These chunks were then used to scaffold rehearsal of the memories. Participants practiced this technique for the home-based chunks based by reminding themselves of the list of memories, chunking and rehearsing them several times, and then recalling them without their notes using the record sheets provided. All right, so we're going to get into the results in a minute. But uh, for now, we're just going to take a quick break, and I will be back in a minute. See you in a minute. All right, the <laughs> window was banging. It was annoying me. All right, so that's taken care of. Um, let's see. Nile. Oh, that's a heavy duty band. I like that. I like that. Great stuff. Um, so to recap, we're gonna get into the results here. But for those of you who are just joining us and missed, we did a memory exercise, or some of us did. And uh, C Daws, I see, is up to ten with the first kitten I got. We picked up off the side of the dirt road. And um, basically the idea is is to create a memory palace first with at least 15 spots. I don't know why they have 15. Does it have to be 15? I don't know. We'll see when we read the rest of the report. But get a nice little memory palace together and then just collect 15 memories. Associate those memories with stations in the memory palace. And then when, when you feel depressed, go to those memories. Go to those memories. All right. Maricella says, that's a great memory of your mother's friend encouraging you to continue studying and probably you went beyond than your classmates. Congratulations. Thanks, Maricella. Yeah, it's just an amazing memory. I, I, I can never thank her enough. She really, it's one of those things because speaking of depression, I was so depressed in high school. Like I just really suffered really badly. And uh, it is... Uh, it was a very difficult time. It was a very difficult time. I lived all over the place, foster homes and uh, here and there. And the other time, one time I was living with this uh, person and, you know, like it just wasn't, it, it was good. She was okay, but uh, it was just was not a good situation overall and uh, really affected me a lot. And it was part of what led me to uh, dropping out of high school. But her real confidence in, 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 the fact that I was the kind of person that ought to be not just going back to high school, but going to university, if nothing else, that really encouraged me. Uh, and I did it. I did it. And I did it because because of her. Like, it sounds kind of crazy, but I really, really did it because I admired her so much. And it meant so much to me to, um, to really symbolically do that. And in many ways throughout life, I've symbolically held her as a mentor many, many times. And it's important to have mental mentors and to aspire to certain people. And it doesn't have to be always the same. Like my friend Jonathan Levy often says, things can be for a season, a reason, or a life. And, uh, you know, you can have different mentors at different times. Anyway, the exercise, if you want to complete it, some of you in the chat have been uh, more active than others with it. But the idea is, is a memory palace with 15 stations, 15 memories, and then 
you place those memories, you associate those memories with each of your stations. And then when you feel depressed, you go through at least part of the Mary Palace, if not all of it, to reduce that depression. So I think this is a, a wonderful exercise. I was able to get 15 memories together and uh, really, really wonderful. Seving says, will I be able to watch the replay? Don't want to, but I have to get back to work. It is 8 a.m. Yeah, this one's going to be here. They only get uh, deleted for strange reasons, and this one I don't see any strange reason why that it would need to be deleted. Um, so feel free to come back and check it out and hope to see a comment from you if you do. All right. Aries says, death metal fans. Yeah, death metal. You know, there's good research that heavy metal helps with your mood. So um, if you're not into it, if you can stomach it and find a way into it, you, you never know. I mean, it's problematic. It's problematic because I don't really like the negative imagery anymore. I used to, and I realized that it was having a negative effect on me. So there's some considerations. But the cool thing with a lot of death metal is you don't have to listen to the words. Right? It's like it's just <laughs> who can understand it anyway, right? Um, but I do notice that some of my choices are, um, you know, can have an impact on me. So it's very, very important. But, you know, it's surprising uh, the amount of positive stuff that's actually out there. Um, so you can seek out things that, that are either neutral to you or more positive. Um, so check that out. But anyway, I like, uh, I like heavy metal a lot. But it can have a negative effect on me, that's for sure. All right. Crystal says, how to use mind palaces to deal with and overcome personal biases? Well, give me an example, Christos, of a personal biases or a personal bias. I'm not sure exactly what you're meaning in this context about personal bias. And uh, Lesh says, please tell me the name of memory software, which is available free. Memory software is not anything I would really um, recommend. So, and if it was free, it's probably not worth having. Um, I am thinking, Nilesh, of putting together some memory software. Uh, having a hard time finding people to do it, though. There's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot on the market in terms of people who can do apps, but it's very hard to find a good one. But I think I have uh, an idea for some for a memory app that's going to work, and then I will show you the idea when I can find someone to bootstrap out a basic version, and then. Um, We'll see. See if you like it. All right. Um, Harry says, have you tried listening to Rush? I am Canadian, my friend. We are fed Rush from beginning to end. <laughs> uh, Tom Sawyer, my friend. Yes, I love Rush. Great Canadian band. Indeed. All right. Nilesh wants software for memorizing numbers. Uh, I can't think of anything. Look, if you want to memorize numbers, learn the major system. Why would you want software? You are the software. Learn the algorithm. It's called the major system. And then you don't need the, the software. Uh, and I can't think of any software that, that teaches it. I had a good chat with a guy about making a software that would help teach the major. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just avoiding the real skill. The real skill is to use these techniques without apps and software. So one needs to do this. One needs to learn it without, I believe. Anyway, um, just to be a little bit more helpful to you there, though, Nilesh, my personal recommendations and my personal uh, little finicky things aside, please go and listen to the link I'm going to put in the chat right now with Idris Zogai. I don't know if his software is for free, but he has an existing piece of software you can get and there's a new one in the works which is called memtopia so see if he still has the existing one available there's a link to it on that page and uh should be showing up in the chat any second here and uh i don't know if it's free or not the existing one but you can check it out and you can listen to our discussion about software and there's a couple of discussions about around software also one with gabriel weiner and i think you'll find it interesting and maybe we'll encourage you to um, to not use it. <laughs> but I, I, as CDOS is saying here, there are phone apps for remembering numbers and Anthony's right, I would not recommend them. Yeah, there, I've never seen anything good. And in any case, even if it were good, what would be the use of it? 
The only thing I can think of is something that would help you learn the major so that you could do the major. Um, but even then, like, what? how would an app do this? Why The major should be five minutes, you know? It shouldn't take that long to learn the major forever and ever. One of the problems is, is that people just won't simply focus for five minutes on anything. So we need to think about, you know, like, how can we get people uh, to focus for longer than five minutes? But major is just super simple. Um, and it's the one time I think you should uh, use rote learning if you have to, to just get it done because it's so life-changing. It's so amazing. Thanks, says Nalesh. All right. So let's uh, carry on with this and read the description of the sample. So two participants did not complete memory training and two could not be contacted at one week follow-up. Data are therefore reported for the remaining 38 participants, 18 in the MOL condition and 20 in the rehearsal condition. The groups did not differ significantly on the diagnostic, mood, cognitive, or demographic measures and uh, see supplementary table for a breakdown of remission status. Uh, as expected, there was no interaction across groups consistent with the comparable gains in memory accessibility in the two conditions. This numerical decrease in BDI scores across the whole sample from session one to session two provides no suggestion that training in positive recollection has a detrimental effect on depressive symptoms. In addition to MDD, we assessed other Axis one diagnoses on the SCID. In the MOL condition, four participants met criteria for panic disorder, three for obsessive compulsive disorder, three for post-traumatic stress disorder, one for social phobia, and three for generalized anxiety disorder. In the rehearsal condition, five met criteria for PD, one for agoraphobia, one for OCD, one four for PTSD, one for SP, three for GAD, and one for specific phobia. Some, some people suffering. All right, let's look at the uh, recall performance. Memory and recall data for the MLL and rehearsal groups are presented in table one. The two groups did not differ for the mean age of selected memories, nor on ratings of how often they thought about the memories, how long they spent cumulatively doing the home-based practice, the ease of adhering to the practice and compliance with task instructions, most importantly, both groups reported that thinking about the memories had a beneficial effect on mood with no difference across groups, verifying that reflecting on vivid, concrete memories of experiences that are subjectively chosen and mood enhancing can have a self-reported positive impact on current effect in those with a depression history. There was no difference in the numbers of memories retrieved at pre-training to address our first hypothesis that both MLL and rehearsal training would lead to significant improvements in recall of memories from pre to post training, we conducted a mixed model, ANOVA, with time as a within subjects factor and group as a between subjects factor and numbers of memories retrieved as the dependent variable. As anticipated, there was a main effect of time with both groups improving across training. There was no significant effect of group nor significant time times group interaction consistent with our expectation that we would find no support for the groups being significantly different in terms of the immediate benefits of training. We next examined our key prediction that there would be greater differential reduction in the ability to recall the target memories at follow-up in the rehearsal group relative to the MLL group after taking account of any memory gains across training to rule out simple carryover effects. We computed a mixed time group rehearsal and COVA looking at numbers of memories retrieved with training gains uh, and as the covariate. As predicted, there's now a significant time times group. This qualified simple main effects of time. Breaking down this interaction, there was no significant change from time two to time three for the MOL group, but there was a significant decline in recall in the rehearsal group. This time group interaction effect remains significant when including pre-training memory scores as a covariate. The interaction was also significant after including our stratification variable uh, of depression status in the ANCOVA. These findings suggest that the relative advantage in memory access at follow-up accrued by the MOL group was not simply a function of pre-training group differences in memory access or mood and or of mood change, across training and was comparable in those episode and in remission. So that's a lot of heavy duty stuff there. And obviously we need to know a lot of what all that terminology means, but let's look at the discussion after I check in with the chat. If you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up, get subscribed to this channel if you aren't already and uh, leave any questions, comments that you have. 
this is your chance to ask them. And you might want to check out the replay because we completed an incredible memory exercise based on this uh, and uh, going to have a lot of fun in the days to come based on the groundwork that some of us laid uh, together. All right, so Nilesh. Uh, well, first of all, Crystal says, let's get going with the study. We aren't done. Yep, we're almost done. We're going to do the discussion in a minute. There's actually only this one page left. And uh, Nilesh says... While remembering 100 digits, please tell me the importance of repeating numbers loudly while memorizing. Uh, please tell me about memorizing different numbers in the same memory palace. So I don't think there is an importance of repeating numbers loudly while memorizing. You can repeat them out loud and that will help you. So, you know, for example, something like, um, I don't know, uh, 8, 9, 9, 10, 9, right? By repeating it out loud, and it's called levels of processing effect, um, you're actually giving an extra layer of repetition through a different part of your brain, different part of your muscles and so forth. So that will help you remember it. But um, in terms of using different numbers in the same memory palace, that's very easy. One of the things you want to do is get yourself one of these. It's called a deck of cards. Learn the major method. Give each card a number, then give each card an image, memorize them, and then get used to using the same memory palace over and over and over again through card training. And you're essentially memorizing numbers, uh, but those numbers have images. So you've turned semantic information into episodic information, and then you use spatial memory to lay it out. And it's one of the most amazing things you'll ever do. Totally changes everything, makes you have an amazing memory that you'll never forget uh, the experience. It's absolutely transformative, and then you can apply it to anything that you want. All right. So Sida says to Nilesh, for the same memory palace, I would use a major system. Yeah, the major is where it's at. Don't skip it. All right, let's get into the discussion here. Our study replicates earlier findings that richly elaborated, concrete, positive, or self-affirming memories in those with a history of depression can have a self-reported beneficial effect on mood. The data also indicate that established mnemonic techniques can facilitate access to a pre-identified set of such memories and that such access can further enhance with it, can be further enhanced with a week of training. To our knowledge, this is the first report of the deployment of such mnemonic strategies in the autobiographical memory domain literature. Importantly, in one of our, uh, in our support, importantly, in support of our key hypothesis, the results suggest that once training has terminated, those who have trained with the MOL show relatively well-maintained levels of memory access on a surprise follow-up recall test in contrast to a significant drop-off in recall in the chunking rehearsal group. The MOL appeared comparably effective and feasible for participants experiencing a current episode of depression, as well as for those in clinical remission, with good training compliance and low dropouts. Some possible limitations merit comment. To ensure that participants would be interacting with someone familiar, the one-week surprise telephone recall test was carried out by the same experimenter who administered sessions one and two and was therefore not blind to experimental condition. To take account of this, we sought to eliminate any role for subjective bias. The recall assessment was therefore fully scripted and read out to participants and no recall prompts were given. The recall data were then double checked by a second rater blind to the experimental condition who had access to the participants notes and tag words regarding the memories and, to and, and no discrepancies were found. We are therefore confident that there was a there was negligible opportunity for experimental bias to exert an effect in contrast, for example, to a diagnostic outcome assessment where subjectivity is much harder to eliminate. A second issue is that we opted for a short follow-up period of one week for this initial study. The findings therefore merit replication with a longer follow-up period. That said, it is also likely that use of a short follow-up worked against our core hypothesis as it provided less time for recall levels in the rehearsal chunking condition, itself an active mnemonic intervention to fall away. In any extended follow-up study, 
It would also be important to examine the degree of intermittent rehearsal required to maintain levels of recollection over longer retention periods. That's where we got you covered. <laughs> the findings provide encouraging support for the use of the MOL as a mnemonic device to assist recall of positive self-affirming memories in individuals with a history of depression. The next step is to explore whether and how the MOL technique could be deployed to facilitate adaptive emotion regulation in this population, which in other words, in the depressed population. One way to do this would be to use some form of negative mood induction in the laboratory and examine participants' ability to repair mood and counteract the negative sorry, and counteract the negative cognitions that arise uh, using memories accessed with the MOL approach. Having established proof of principle that the MOL strategy can be used in the service of mood repair, it would then be important to map the spontaneous use of and benefits associated with this technique in the day-to-day -day response to downturns in mood, possibly using a diary measure or some form of experience sampling. An important corollary of this work would be an evaluation of how much training is required to securely establish the memory repository so that it can be readily accessed weeks and months after initial learning and whether such longer term retention requires an intermittent re rehearsal regime and if so how it would be best how it would best be facilitated it would also be interesting to explore the extent to which the ability to access self affirming memories using the MOL has effects on symptoms of depression other than negative mood this will inform whether the technique is best conceptualized as an adjunct to extant therapies or has potential as a standalone low intensity intervention. The current study has focused on using the MOL to access memories. It is important to examine the broader applicability of the technique. One potential ac application is for the creation of a repository of information about therapeutic strategies or skills that users could employ to enhance their mental health. Complex interventions such as cognitive behavior therapy provide their, uh, their um, recipients with a repertoire of skills that need to be rehearsed and maintained once therapy has finished. Techniques such as the MOL could play a part in assisting such maintenance. Indeed, indeed. Not only could it, but it has for me, for sure. And one of the things that we know is that... Um, the skill, like just the development of a skill helps you develop more skills. So anything that you do in life should always be focused on developing more skills, right? Whether you want to or not, just keep developing more skills because you're going to develop the basis for essentially the skill of learning skills, right? And then you'll pick them up faster and sooner and easier and so forth. And this will be uh, something that is very, very positive in your life. So... Um, <clears throat> I was just doing some research on juggling, for example, uh, juggling compared to chess. And juggling and chess share in, in common the fact that you will develop the ability to develop other skills, either motor skills or decision-making skills and so forth, because you've developed the ability in those realms. So some information is coming out about that on the Magnetic Mary Method YouTube channel soon. So check that out in the future. And uh, what a great article. I really, really find this study very, very compelling and a great description of why I was able to really handle depression a lot better after I started using memory techniques. Using memory techniques strategically, consistently, practically every day. This will create neuroplastic change. They don't talk about any neuroplastic change here, but it's pretty much well documented in other studies. We know, for example, from uh, brain scans of memory athletes that there's significant neuroplastic change. And you don't have to be a memory athlete to get out a deck of cards and memorize them. You don't have to be a memory athlete to learn these techniques and learn a language, apply the techniques to learning the language. It will change your brain. Bilingualism is one of the best investments you'll ever make because of the health it creates for your brain. And uh, it's just amazing, amazing, and more amazing. All right, let's check in with the chat. Snark is in the house. And you say, sorry for joining with my Snark account. I'm just a little busy uploading videos on my Snark account, so I kind of have to juggle two accounts. I have no um, problem with a username like Snark. I like the word Snark. I don't always like Snark, but sometimes Snark has its place. And you're asking if I have children. Well, first of all, thank you for your question. Thanks for being here. 
uh, I don't know what your other, oh, it's Christos. All right. Um, never Tony. Thank you. Always Anthony. There's no Tony in the house. Oh, here's one. Sorry. There is a Tony in the house. Tony Buzan. But I am Anthony. And no, I don't have children. Thank you for asking. All right. So we got Nalesh here. And Nalesh says, I know the major system, but I'm not using the same. Well, why not? What are you using? Uh, Billy says, what's the most unusual technique to remember math equations? Um, I have no idea what is the most unusual technique. Or, or sorry, you said the usual technique. What's the usual technique? Well, usually what people do is use rote learning, which is uncreative, boring, and not at all fun. So avoid, um, avoid that at all costs. Nilesh says, I want to know if I have 100 object persons memorize, for memorizing numbers, then using it again and again, will it improve memory? <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that question. What, would, what about using your memory makes you think that it won't improve your memory? That's the question I have for you. And I don't know. You have to go and do it and see if it improves your memory. Um, what you're talking about is developing what's often called a PAO. And I'm all, almost certain it will improve your memory, but I actually don't know. You have to go and do it. And you have to do it correctly. You have to do it well. You have to do it with dedication. And you know you have to practice it. And you have to develop it to such an extent that you're able to just look at two digits and instantly come up with that person. What's the most likely for you to come up with the person or the action or the object or whatever it is that you've associated there, if not all three? Well, the most likely way to do that, I think, for most people is to base it on the major. But a lot of people don't base it on the major. They just do an arbitrary association. So, you know, they might take uh, Charlie Chaplin as 33 because that's just what they read some other dude did, right? And that can work. That can work. To me, that would make no sense. Based on the major, it's a mime, very specific mime. And uh, I refer to a, a particular um, show that I saw on Euphoria Emporium where they have this uh, skit about mimes and they say, <laughs> anyway, it's funny. You got to see it for yourself. But it's, it's always in my mind. So it's a very particular mime and a very powerful image. So those are the two sorts of ways that I know and really recommend both of them. And, you know, enjoy, enjoy the process. It will improve your memory. It's like really impossible for it not because you'll learn so much about your memory, what it is, how memory works, and you'll have a, a lot of fun along the way. So if you have any more questions, pop them into the chat. We had a fun time. I want to know from you, do you like this kind of science? Should we do more science on this channel? Is this useful? Is it helpful? This is the first time just going through reading this thing from beginning to end. Guide me if you like it, if you enjoy it, if it's useful for you. Your silence is also an answer. You can vote no with your silence. I will pay attention. If nobody cares, if nobody wants more, let me know. And uh, obviously you can... Um, you can send articles that you think might be interesting to go through, but I really need to uh, know that you guys want this and are interested in it and appreciate it either now in the live chat or in the future. If you, um, if you decide that you, you know, want to leave a, leave an email or so and uh, leave a chat on the replay. If you're watching the replay, that works too. Indeed, indeed, indeed. But let me know, because silence is also an answer. And I will respond to silence just as much as I will respond to to anything else. All right. So Harry says he's interested. Nyla says, yeah, very useful. Nyla says, no, we're asking questions. So is it yes or no? Please see all the questions and answer them if possible. I don't know that I missed any of your questions, Nilesh. So if you, oh, I see. How will I rememorize this number? So 45, 68, 61, 13, 48. All right, so Nilesh, here's the thing. What does it matter how I would do it? Are you going to learn to do it? I'll show you how I would do it, but what does it matter how I would do it? What matters is, are you going to do it? And so let's break it down. Let's have a look at this and I'll show you what you can do. So I'm just gonna change this a little bit and 
whoops, make it a little bit more representative for all the fine folk here. There we go. Right. So it's going to show up in the chat here on the screen in a second. And let's see. While we're waiting for it to show up, CDOS says, I like this. Have you used Loki for lucid dreaming at all, Anthony? Yes, I have. Um, although not in a direct way. Uh, we can talk more about that. There's some videos. If you search the channel for dreams, you'll, you'll hear some more of that. Maricella says, I like to know more always. Thanks. Um, Snark says, how to learn the piano. What is the things that I got to do first to learn the piano? All right, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, doo -doo -doo. William says, it was interesting for sure. Awesome, awesome. Great. So, yeah, keep letting me know. Keep letting me know. So 45. What is 45? This is Superman bending a rail of a railroad track. So if we have a memory palace, there's going to be a memory palace and uh, there's going to be Superman bending the rail, right? Then uh, 68, Rashomon, right? Because this is all based on the major. So now we have Superman bending a rail and he's wrapping it around Rashomon, you know, that samurai in the movie Rashomon, his neck. And then 61, right? This is um, a cheetah. So um, now we're going to have the... Uh, Superman with Rashomon and Rashomon is himself. So Superman is strangling uh, Rashomon and then Rashomon is himself strangling a cheetah with his, um, with his legs, his dangling legs. Now the interesting thing here is if you do this, then cheetah is not cheetah on its own, but cheetah is also the jack of clubs because 61 is the number of this card in the system as I do it. So now I have an extra memory queue, right? Don't necessarily use it, but it's there. All right, so now so we've got 45, 68, 61, 34. This is the nightmare from the Piers Anthony novel, Nightmare, which is a horse. So it's just mare, right? Uh, if you know the major, you're following along. Um, and that also happens to be the four of diamonds, right? So now we can do this. So we've got um, these images that we're piling up and they're getting really exciting now, right? Because we just start to encode. We've got Superman with his, his rail, he's bending it around Rashomon, and then he's got this with his, uh, the Rashomon's got his legs around the cheetah, right? So 61. And then now we've got the nightmare. So we go to another part of the memory palace and then 81 is uh, Weird Al Yankovic doing the Michael Jackson song Fat, right? Uh, if, you're if you know the major, you're following along. 66 is Cheech from Cheech and Chong. Uh, 68 is um, Chevy Chase. And then 95 is PAL cassette tape. Um, and sometimes I use Paul from, from the Beatles as well. So those things, images just need to interact and put them on memory palaces and then have those characters interacting with each other. And that's how you would memorize that. So very, very simple and fun. All right. CDOS says, I'll look for your channel for dreams. Thank you. Very, very welcome. And uh, there's a course in the masterclass all about memorizing dreams. And a lot of people find that within a couple of days, if not the very next day, they start to remember tons of dreams. And it will trigger, trigger lucid dreaming even if that's not the express point of the course, even if that's not really my favorite thing to have happen. But yes, um, th there, is, uh, there is an involvement to be had there with, um, with, with uh, lucid dreaming and, and memory techniques and so forth. And we have a lot of fun. I don't know if Arvinder is still here today, but he was in one of our me dream memory intensives. And man, did we ever have a great time. He's he's done almost 90 now memory palaces that he's just extracted from free associating with his dreams. So that's really, really a lot of fun, what you can do with your dreams and memory. Snark says, I love using mnemonics for geography. Okay, so you asked about how to learn to play the piano, the things that I do first. First is not really what I... I don't really know what to do first, but let's be logical about this. Have a piano. <laughs> I wouldn't try to learn piano on the screen. This is uh, not necessarily a very um, useful way to learn the piano. So if you really learn the piano, have at least a keyboard uh, and tactile. Now, 
the other thing would be to learn some of the notes, right? So, you know, you find where C is and then you find the whole spread and so forth. So you can just learn, you know, C, D, E and so forth and C and C sharp. Learn those things, learn where they are on the keyboard. And so that's a lot of fun. And then uh, after that, hit all the keys, learn about the hand positions, think about, you know, where it's recommended that your hands fall on that layout, and uh, then learn some ditties, learn some songs, and then learn about dedicated practice. So this answers really um, Nilesh's question about revision, because revision and dedicated practice are very related. So uh, give me a second, and I'll put on the bass here. Do, 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 hearing the songs of uh, background music, canned music, elevator music. Do, 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 do. Bum, 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 bum. Elevator music, elevator music, blah, 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 blah. Elevator music, elevator music. Yeah, okay, we're back. All right. Um, so to uh, learn how to... Uh, dedicated practice how that works. <laughs> Snark has a piano. Okay, great. So what we would want to do is understand the problem that a lot of people have is they're learning music and they always start, you know, at the beginning of the song and then they go to the end. I'm not really set up to show the bass here, but... So um, I'm trying to think of something where you could see the hands here. If you learn that, right, uh, something like that, you're playing, you want to um, understand that dedicated practice means stopping yourself before you get frustrated and stopping yourself from going back to the beginning of songs and work on phrases. So I kind of don't really remember the last time that I needed to do this, but, uh, you know... Let's see, where are we? So yeah, let's say there, say I made a mistake right there, right? Instead of going back to the beginning of the song, we got to go. and just get that smooth before going back to the beginning of the song. And then you might want to play, you know, a little bit before it, a little bit after it. Like that, right? So dedicated practice is is really working on just where the where the uh, problem parts are and then going back. And so that would be the same with the piano. Um, figure out little ditties, isolate little parts, smooth up those little parts, and then, you know, understand that that fluid performance of a piece of music from beginning to end comes from uh, really the refinement of lots of little parts along the way. And so that's kind of what revision is, even in a memory palace. It's um, looking into the parts of your memory palace that are really strong and, you know, letting them continue to be strong, but looking into the parts that are weak and then refining them. So if uh, you if you had memorized some numbers, for example, and you were just like, oh, what was that? Then you got to go in and like practice strengthening that one image and uh, allowing yourself to spend the time, invest the time in sharpening up that image rather than, you know, skipping forward and, and not doing the due diligence that it deserves. All right. So I hope that helps answer your question there, Snark, about what to do with piano and so forth. Um, let's see. What else do we have in our chat? Dwight, live in Burnaby, previously PG in McKenzie, but originally from Toronto. Wow, Prince George, I guess, is what PG is there. Yeah, I lived in PG for a while. I went to UNBC for a while. Wow. It's been a while since I was in Bur Burnaby, but um, amazing place. Amazing place. And uh, obviously, I spent lots of time in Toronto. But McKenzie, no, I haven't really uh, had much time. Uh, well, I've never, I don't think I've ever been there. Uh, haven't had much time to go there. Anyway, uh, let's see. Dwight says, question, 
what do you think of using Google Maps Street View for the journey method for all the places where I lived in? Yeah, you can do it. I mean, by all means, I don't think it's going to replace drawing your memory palaces, but definitely do it. Definitely do it. Um, let me know if you have more questions around it. But basically, it, it's just not a replacement for drawing them at all, unless that for you that it is. All right. But do let me know more if you, if you have more questions. Um, Nilesh says, what's the benefit one can have after memorizing long digits of numbers? Well, there's a couple of benefits. One, you have the memory, you have the memories of the long digits of numbers. Two, you have better skills with the memory techniques because you've practiced memorizing numbers. Three, you're able to see connections between how numbers can help you memorize other things. There may be more benefits. Um, so dive in, dive in. Snark says, the solo reminds me of animals as leader guitarist. Okay, great, great. Um, that was Bach that I was playing, actually, but great if it reminds you of animals. Uh, Nilesh says, the benefit is being able to, or Sidaz says to Nilesh, being able to remember the numbers and after practicing you will get faster, like Anthony demonstrated in making a story very quickly. Nilesh says, how much faster it can become? That's up for you to find out, my friend. Um, they're going real fast these days. Apparently, Nelson Dulles is now like, even faster than Alex Mullen was with cards. So um, you decide. <laughs> Marichella says, my last dream, I was hitting the fits with the student outside the classroom. I entered into it, saw a teacher, students, and bookshelves with books and angels and pictures. It was fun. That's an amazing dream. Amazing. Snark says, piano is not as cool as electric guitar. It all depends on how you play it, my friend. It all depends. Now it says, how many years? I don't know what your question refers to on how many years, but it really does depend on you. You have the potential to be as fast as Anthony with years of practice, says C does. It's not something that comes quickly. Yeah, but I would just say, though, that it can come quickly. Here's the definitive factor. Do you practice? Do you practice consistently? I think you can get it really, really quickly. Um, so here's how this works. And it works very, very simply. Why more people won't do it? Mystery to me. But um, certainly I have my own mysteries in life. There's things I won't do. <laughs> and it's a mystery to me why I won't do them. So don't feel bad if you don't do it. Um, obviously, the, uh, the obvious is something that a lot of us don't do. So no need for self-punishment. That can be depressing. But you might want to think about it. But um, really what you need to do is you need to sit down and do this. You need to sit down and do it consistently for long enough to actually develop the skill. And again, remember that every time you're developing a skill, you're developing the skill of developing skills, right? So don't delay. Figure out what skill you want, then use the skill and use the skill to memorize information that's going to improve your life. So I didn't actually memorize, you know, Superman and Rashomon and the cheetah and all that stuff. I just gave you the examples because that's not going to improve my life. Memorizing numbers that you display there. I mean, sometimes I do it and I did it the other day. I actually really memorized something. Um, but it's the practice of coming up with the with the numbers and the cards. And some of my numbers are a little weaker than others because I do more card memorization than I do number memorization. But there's a simple, I don't have it here, but there's another deck of cards that just has numbers that you can practice with from time to time. But I'm much faster with just the numbers that appear here because of their relationship to cards. Um, so, you know, you want to you want to pick the battles that you actually can win and want to win. So if you have a real benefit that's going to improve your life on a daily basis for memorizing numbers, then memorize numbers. Most people, that may not be the case. A lot of people, they would really benefit a lot if they could just remember the names of people, the names of authors of books and so forth. Like, for example, we didn't look at it here, but, you know, how would we remember Tim Dalglish, right? Just to take the head, the head author here. Well, I remember I had a drummer in one of my bands named Gary Dalglish. So I could see my friend Tim or my uncle Tim in a battle with them and uh, memorize that name, for example. Um, and we've done this before on live streams before, like uh, Fergus Craik and Robert Lockhart who came up with the levels of processing effect in 1972. So that's like a cool thing. That actually improves my life because I know more about the memory science and I've actually memorized this information. So that's a, a very important distinction there. Nilesh asks, do you think everyone can memorize? 
everybody does. I mean, barring barring um, brain trauma, congenital, congenital defects, etc., everybody's memorizing all the time. You're memorizing right now. Whether you're going to remember what we said today, I don't know. But memorizing is happening all the time. These techniques, there's no one who can't use them unless they don't want to. And the mystery of um, why some people do and some don't is something we're all trying to solve, you know? Wouldn't it be great if all humans had the wherewithal to train themselves to be the best that they could be, right? Some of us are convinced that we can help others, and so we do all that we can to help others, and uh, we, we, we jump in and do the work, and other people, eh, they don't care, or whatever, but we don't know why. And we, if we knew that, the world would be a very, very different place. But some of us just do what we can so that we can help others find the path because we're urging, you know, we're evolving. The whole, the whole species is evolving, and sometimes it's devolving, but we're helping each other progressively. And the, look at what the technology is doing. The technology now is almost loose on its own, optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. YouTube just made a change to the portal. I was a little bit gripey about it because I was just like, this is not better. This actually makes everything more difficult, more clicks to do the simple things and yada, yada, yada. But they're like, you could see that they're actually trying to optimize the performance of YouTube creators. And so as a collective goal, it's like urging us to do better because they're showing us more metrics and yada, yada, yada. And so it's going to help us improve whether we want to or not. And if we want to continue to use the platform, we're going to have to use it in different ways and so forth. So there's this kind of thing where there's something neat happening with the technology and there's the dark side to it, but there's a lot of bright side to it too, where they're just making us be better. They're making us be better, which is what the free market is always about, right? It's what competition is all about. It's why that the fittest who can collaborate and who can adapt collaboratively with others are the ones who survive. They're the ones who not only survive, but thrive. And so your answer really, Nailesh, is of course everyone can memorize, but why is it that everybody doesn't? And we just simply don't know. But as information picks up and speeds up, memory is going to be an even bigger advantage for those who have it, who have the ability to learn quickly, remember things specifically. And it's going to be something that harms those people who don't. And it's very, very important to understand that we need to be sympathetic to them because they don't necessarily choose their lack of gung-ho, let's go get this done. And that's the best I can say about that. But everybody can. It's just not everybody will. And that's just the, the nature of the universe. All right. So Benjamin is in the house. Good to see you, Ben. Just jumped in, so you may have covered this. Any ways to reverse engineer the idea in the study to make negative memories less accessible? Yeah, well, that's almost what at the end of this article they're saying here. So let me uh, re re repeat that for you. Um, basically, it was in here uh, where they're asking, like they, they haven't done the study of this, but I think it totally makes sense. Basically, what they're saying is um, to explore whether the MOL technique could be employed to facilitate adaptive emotion regulation in this population. One way to do this would be to use some form of negative mood induction in the laboratory and examine participants' ability to repair mood and counteract the negative cognitions that arise using memories accessed with the MOL approach or using the memory palace. And so what that means is that you know they haven't done it yet but i've done it to myself like i've had these negative memories and i've just be like not only mm, accept it but exaggerate it invite it so that we can just get it into a merry palace work it out and uh, defang it that way now in my experience that's not exactly a guarantee that it's going to stay away or be defanged forever but as this uh, article says in the beginning, it talks about how there's a tendency in depressed people, which I've seen this in my own depression states when I've had them. Thank God they're gone, but I have no guarantee that they're gone forever. But it says that there's a tendency to categorical remembering. That's here. There's categorical remembering characterized by general themes reflecting repetitive and um, regularity across personal experiences, including positive events. So... 
I think there's a lot of work that can be done here. And um, I think that part of this thing is this study here is and this exercise we did today is to just focus on the positive and have those positive memories as a go-to replacement for when the negative memories come. But as they suggest in this study, there's work to be done in, in the laboratory setting, getting people to induce negative memories and work with them. So this is kind of classic um, cognitive behavioral therapy where, you know, you would, a person like happened to me, you know, I had these impulses like jump off bridges and stuff like real bad harm OCD. Just uh, one of the therapists I had was like, hey, Let's go to the bridge together to actually, you know, in a therapeutic setting, which I could not imagine in any sense that it was going to help me to go with this guy to walk to a bridge. But that's the idea is you actually exacerbate it under a control, uh, controlled situation so that you defang it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot to be done still. And if he had said, you know what? Let's start by building a bridge in a memory palace and using that bridge to memorize some information. I think it would have been a lot more effective, which is ultimately what I sort of did. And this happened when I learned actually a meditation from a guy named Michael Roach, who I just heard some talks that were recorded of his. And he taught a very simple meditation that I memorized using a memory palace. And it's when I realized that in the Buddhist tradition, they essentially use memory palaces to memorize um, uh, some certain kinds of meditation. And in this meditation, he said, imagine just over here in the corner of this temple. Uh, I wasn't in the temple. I was just listening to it on an audio book. And I was just imagining this temple that they must have been in or room anyway, but he was talking, he was referring to a temple. Um, and he said, just here, imagine a bridge. And as you walk over the bridge, enemies, your enemies, like your enemies in life are firing arrows that are on fire at the bridge. And you have to cross this bridge before it burns down. And then after you get to the next part uh, over the bridge, now imagine over here there's a party and these are all your friends accepting you with gifts and they're happy to see you and so forth. And then it went on. It had a number of other images. But that bridge was inside of my memory palace and then that really helped me get over this uh, harm OCD of uh, bridges and stuff. So you could think of it that way. Um, so not only did I memorize the actual meditation, but I chose a specific bridge to work with inside of it. So I hope that answers your question. And uh, let's see what else we got. Nala says, when it comes to card memorization, how many pairs you have to remember? You have to remember no pairs. You just remember 52 images. So they only become pairs when you put them together. So for example, we had uh, the cheetah, which is 61. And then we mentioned earlier the four of diamonds because one of the numbers that you gave was uh, 43 there in your uh, thing, I believe. Uh, no, it was 34, wasn't it? Sorry, because maybe I, sometimes when I do these things, I put the wrong numbers. Let me go back to your numbers there. No, it was 34. So that's the mayor, right? Sorry. Where did I get 43? Was there another 43 in there? No, sometimes I have this thing. I've had it a, a couple of times where I reverse the digits, but I had uh, three of diamonds or four of diamonds rather, which is, which is 34. So now this is a pair, right? And so we have um, uh, essentially 61 and 34. And so if we had 43 in there, that would be the king of diamonds. Is that right? Yeah. So let's find our king of diamonds. And the reason why the king of diamonds is 43 is because it's a Dodge Ram. And a Dodge Ram is uh, the one that my dad had. So king of diamonds is now, this uh, is 43, then this is 34, and then this is 61. And so whatever order they're in, they essentially only become pairs or triplets or quadruplets or quintuplets, depending on how you have the images behind them interact. So this would be a cheetah that's, I don't know, bouncing on the hood of, of the Dodge Ram. And then the, in the back of the Dodge Ram, the nightmare or the horse, the mare is, you know, jumping around. Um, and if you were to do it this way, then now we've got 
This would be the nightmare or the horse, the black horse, who would then be kicking the cheetah in the head. And then it, maybe he's kicking him so hard that he's smashing into the Dodge Ram. And then that's either going to end that sequence or we could add another card. So we have the Hoover Dam or Jagger Hoover or the Hoover Vacuum, whatever that's going to be. And we add that. And we just keep doing that along a memory palace journey. And uh, the only sort of thing that ever happens is, is exactly what happened here, where I'll sometimes in my mind reverse the digits. And it's annoying, and I don't know why it happens, but sometimes it does. But I usually have a sense of like, no, no, no that doesn't make sense. Um, uh, and I'll know that it doesn't make sense. All right. So good questions, good questions. Keep them coming. Um... Now that says I don't. I actually don't memorize numbers because I don't have situations where I need it. I use Loki to memorize console commands for SQL servers mainly. Awesome. How are we memorizing is happening all the time? Can you explain in simple words? I have a free course, Nilesh, and I will highly recommend that you take it. It's in very simple words. Thousands of people complete the homework assignment, send them to me all the time, so it must be in simple words. And I look forward to yours as well. That's coming in the chat for you. Um, do, do, do. Kyle says, is there a certain limit to memorizing techniques? Otherwise, could you argue with enough practice someone could be as smart, if not smarter, than someone like Einstein? Well, how smart was Einstein? I mean, I don't know what, what that means. It's a good question. It's an interesting question. But how, how, how smart was Einstein? Like, how, would you, how do you measure this? How do you know? And uh, what does it matter? I mean... What what is the what is the high and amazing thing that that this smartness that you 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 you're setting as a as a milestone or a or a destination how how do we measure this what are we saying about it how are we quantifying it how can it be a goal I don't I think that the I think that the real issue that needs to be thought about here is why is that a goal like what how is that even meaningful. What is the meaning of Einstein? What is the smartness of Einstein? If you really think about that, I think you'll start to see that the answer to your question is really, really, is really, really an opportunity to reflect on the nature of intelligence, the nature of what it means to be a human, and just to let go of this idea that there ever really was an Einstein that you could understand in any such term in the same sense that there's no you that you could understand in any such way, right? And what I mean by this is that that thing that was called Einstein is such a complex, multi-varied understanding that is stored in the hard drives of many, many heads and in the hard drives of many books, many websites, many videos, many lectures, etc., etc. Einstein is a thing that is always transforming that no longer exists, right? It is built. And so what you're doing in that question is you're building an impossible goal because Einstein never ends unless he's forgotten. And he may well be forgotten. Shakespeare may be forgotten at some point in history. Heck, if you look at the, what is it, seven dynasties of ancient Egypt, think of all the dudes that were forgotten and will always be forgotten and aren't even retrievable because they're so gone, right? So th I think that there's an opportunity there to really reflect on that question from a completely different angle. And so the question is, is there a limit to memorizing techniques? Well, if you frame things that way, it's more than a limit. It's an impossible goal. It's an impossible goal because there is no Einstein. There is no Einstein. Einstein is something that is in creation as we speak and is recreated again and again and again. So maybe frame it a different way and let's see if we can figure out a different way of thinking about this. But practicing memory techniques doesn't even necessarily lead to being smarter. It will, almost certainly. But not if you sit around memorizing playing cards all day. That's not going to make you smarter, right? <laughs> and then if you learn a language, right? Well, is that going to make you smarter or is it going to make you bilingual, right? Because there's a lot of people who speak multiple languages and who are still dead as a doornail in terms of their intelligence and their wherewithal to be contributing members of society. So let's think this through. 
in a, in a different way and create different goals that are actually meaningful and forget about could we become more or less intelligent than somebody else? There is no somebody else to become in, as intelligent as. You are you. And that you-ness is so full and so complete and so rich that if you would just focus more on that in a non-narcissistic way, but rather understanding that this thing that you're in, whatever Einstein is, is as completely known to you as it's ever going to be based on your understanding of Einstein never being complete. You cannot complete your understanding of Einstein. So you can never become Einstein, even if you, even if, even if you could collect all the data about him in the, in the world. You could never do this. But you can focus on being the most complete iteration of yourself, which most people are not the most complete iteration of themselves. They are not even completely uh, in touch with what it is to be in touch with the present moment, right? So that's what we focus on. And can memory training do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I suggest you memorize some of the Sanskrit that I've been talking about, because it'll help you. All right. Nilesh says, very useful conversation. Thanks, Nilesh. Glad you're finding it useful. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the chat where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and if you enjoy this kind of discussion. Uh, Maricella says, I think these conversations are important because we do not listen to this information in our daily environment. It can change our mentality to improving our lives and overcome obstacles. Great, great. Yes, uh, Nilesh agrees. Very useful conversations. Nilesh asks, do you know what is the criteria number of digits for setting Guinness record in two minutes? Nope, I do not. I also don't particularly care, although if you go and look it up, feel free to let me know. Maybe I'll memorize it. Maybe not. I really don't care about records. I don't care about prizes. I don't care about awards, etc. Um, if I if I ever do, then, you know, smack me, remind me of today and say, you said you didn't care. Um, the, the odd exception is, is I'll sometimes point out the number of subscribers that we have, but that's just because that's just amazing. It's not about a, a, an award or anything like this or whatever and I, I i'm more just like wow like if you imagine that many people have pressed subscribe that's that's pretty huge that's pretty amazing it's like just it's just amazing in and of itself without any regard for uh what it actually you know would mean in terms of an accomplishment or anything like that all right dwight says thank for your response i was wondering how you would use meditation with this topic by the way, I get I got the book you recommended, The Mind Illuminated. Um, and you say, okay, you answered part of it. I'm not sure which part I answered or which part I didn't, but if uh, a part is missing, then please uh, ask again, ask away. And Nihilesh says, thanks for your answer. You are an awesome and kind person. Well, excellent, excellent. Um, thank you for that, Nihilesh. I appreciate it. Wow. So I think enough people have said that they like some memory science. Maybe we'll um, do some more in the future. If, you watch in, if you're watching the, the replay, let me know as well. Um, hit the thumbs up. Get subscribed to this channel if you aren't already. And uh, keep in touch. And we'll do some more memory science in the future. To be sure, really uh, have a lot of fun on these sessions. And Nilesh asks, few people memorize a deck of cards in 20 seconds. How is it possible? All right. So how it's possible is they get a deck of cards. Then what they do, and there's different ways of doing this, but they're usually connected in some way, is they create an image for each and every card, right? So three of clubs is, is Lammy Lamb, right? And then King of Diamonds, we already know, is the Dodge Ram. Then we already know this is the Cheetah for me. This is the Mare. This is, uh, what is this, Eight of Hearts. So this is a fife, which is like a, a flute. It's actually the Jethro Tull flute. This is, uh, the, this is the, what do you call him, the Michelin Man, and so on. And there's a reason why. And so all you do is then you practice the speed at which you can recognize what the card is, translate it into an image, translate the image into an episodic interaction. So Jethro Tull is now going to smack the, the mare on the head, and then the mare is going to bite the cheetah, etc. And if you work on that, 
you can break any record that you want. And it's pretty amazing how they keep breaking those records faster and faster over time. It's really amazing to watch. And uh, I think it's a lot of fun too to practice card memory myself. I just don't do it for competitive reasons. I do it simply because it's great brain exercise. And it's very, very rewarding because it helps you with other things in memory, such as speed of association for names and so forth. Um, and you know, the other th cool thing about it is that when you do it at different times of day, you'll get a better sense of what your memory energy is like and how good you're feeling and so forth. And uh, you know, you'll be able to pick your battles better, uh, which is very, very important. And speaking of picking battles, had a great time today, ready to call it a day. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for such a great and lively discussion. Make sure I know loud and clear if you like this stuff and uh, hit me up over at magneticmemorymethod.com. Get the free course if you haven't taken it before. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel. If you aren't already subscribed, hit that thumbs up if you haven't hit it already. And listen, as I always like to say, until we speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye. <laughs>